from that PPE kit, but not using the actual. Uh, sir, I'm starting the process of that. going live, sir. I'll just yeah. inform you it's as well. Just the thing that they have. Yeah. Okay. I'm just starting the process. I'll tell you within the live, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll hand over to Doctor uh, Chaudhary. Going live. Yeah. So he'll introduce yeah? And then yeah, he'll, then he'll send it to me. Then I'll I'll hand over to you, sir. Sure. Yeah. So my introduction is just a very brief thing about. Uh, we are live now, sir. A very good okay, afternoon great. from Auto TV side. Uh, today we have a webinar of uh, Bihar Orthopedics proximal shoulder. I'm now handing over to our secretary, Dr. Rajivaran, sir. President. So I think uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a matter of great privilege that this is our fourth webinar, which we are conducting today, is on uh, fracture proximal humerus. And uh, eminent faculty from uh, India and as well as abroad are with us. I'll just name them. Dr. John Mukhopadhyay from Patna, India. Dr. Vikas Agase, Mumbai. Dr. Radha Khan Pandey from Lister, UK. And uh, Dr. Thira Chai, Happy Batakakul from Thailand. Dr. Thailand. Ash Mr. Dr. Ashish Babulkar. Dr. Ashish Babulkar from Pune. <laughs> so, from on behalf of Bihar Orthopedic Association, I welcome all the faculties and all the viewers for our this fourth webinar on proximal uh, fracture surgery, uh, fracture humerus. So, I'll hand over to my president, POA president, Dr. Manoj Chaudhary, to say a few words. Mm, dear audience. Is he here? Yeah, yeah, he's there. Yeah, you need to be a bit louder, Manoj. Oh, uh, dear audience. It's better. Am I doing? Yeah, yeah. Dear audience, delegates, and faculties, I, President Bihar Orthopedic Association, welcome you at the fourth webinar of BOA, and the topic of discussion is proximal humerus fractures esteemed national and international faculties and panelists are taking part. I am happy to find the name of Dr. John Mukhopadhyay. Whenever I see his name, I become nostalgic. Well back in our early days, we were working together in Patna Medical College Hospital. This webinar is important as we have included non-operative treatment part also. The recent trend is we try to operate in most of the cases. This is drift towards right. We are forgetting the art of non-operative management. I am sure this webinar will create some interest in non-operative treatment also. It is an interactive session. I request you to kindly take an active part by asking questions. For this, contact numbers have been given. Please do not forget to mention your name. I repeat, please do not forget to mention your name while asking questions. Dr. Rajiv Anand, Secretary and Chairman of IOA CME Committee will be, taking, will be moderating the session and I am now uh, giving it to, to Dr. Rajiv yeah. Anand. Yes, thank sir. you. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now, without wasting much of your time, I'll just uh, hand over the baton to Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, who will introduce the, introduce the course. Dr. John okay, Mukhopadhyay, please. Yeah, so thank you very much and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. I think in these days of the COVID pandemic, we're also having an epidemic of webinars. So when Rajiv asked me to organize one on proximal humerus, uh, I was trying to look at what we can do, which would be useful for people who are attending the webinar in terms of uh, their daily work. And I think um, uh, we've got an excellent faculty together and I really thank all of them for being here with us today. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Pandey from uh, Leicester and he's going to talk to about uh, conservative management of these fractures. and. This is important because proximal humerus fractures, many can be managed 
uh, conservatively. And this is even of more importance today in the COVID era where you want to avoid any surgery that is not absolutely necessary. Okay, we have uh, Thira Chai from uh, Chiang Mai in Thailand, and he's the leading person in the world on minimally invasive techniques of various uh, fractures and also the editor of the AO book on minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. And it's great to have Thira Chai here with us to talk to us about the uh, techniques for minimally invasive fixation of the proximal humerus fractures. We have Vikash Agashe from Hinduja, Mumbai, who all of you know, and he's going to give us a brief introduction on the surgical anatomy, as well as talk about the conventional methods of open reduction and internal fixation. I'll be talking on salvage and neglected fractures and failed fixations, while Ashish, again, uh, a worldwide expert on shoulder, uh, both on arthroscopic, uh, arthroplasty, as well as trauma. And it's great to have him here today to talk to us about the indications for arthroplasty in proximal humerus fractures where uh, fixation is likely uh, to not succeed and uh, the techniques and the options that we have uh, in the reconstructive uh, ladder in treating these fractures. So it's a great to have all of you here. And I think uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Vikash, who's gonna first go through a, a brief talk on the sur relevant surgical anatomy for proximal humerus fracture. Vikash. Yeah. Good afternoon, friends. It's a great honor to be here taking part in a webinar on uh, proximal humerus fractures. I'm sure most of you would say, oh my God, you are talking of anatomy. So the idea today is not to have a formal talk on anatomy, but I just briefly touch a few points which we very often overlook as regards surgical anatomy is concerned. We all know that the shoulder has two, four articulations and the main joint or the humoro, uh, glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint. The socket size is increased by the labrum. Now something which we often overlook, shoulder is a class three liver. That means the fulcrum is here, the load is far away and the effort is in between. Same thing shown here. That's the shoulder. That's the deltoid muscle, which is the force. And the weight is well away. Now, essentially, class three levers are not very efficient, but they help you in fast movements like this. The class one lever is very, very efficient. Class 3 is not. And therefore, the shoulders for such rapid movements need to have very large muscles. And that is why we have large muscles like deltoid, the serratus, the pectoralis, the uh, latissimus dorsi, and so on and so forth. Now then, there is a downside. When the large muscles are in the direction of the humerus, you know what would happen? the humerus would be just shifted proximally. And to prevent that shift, the head of the humerus is held very, very well or stabilized by the rotator cuff. As you can see here, the rotator cuff just holds the head of the humerus against glenoid. A common simile, when you try to lift the ladder, by a force here, unless this man stabilizes the ladder by holding his leg here or foot here, the, the lever, the uh, ladder will just keep shifting. And that is why, as you can see here, the rotators hold the upper end humerus well. That's the articulation and the deltoid is working far away. So the class three lever helps us in having fast movements, the efficiency, the, the, it is made strong by very strong muscles, 
but it, the upper end humerus is held very well by the rotators and therefore the tuberosity in proximal humerus which give attachment to these humerus are very 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 important in fractures of upper end humerus because of the proximity to major vessels the vascular injuries are rare but must be identified for example here this man came in with absent pulse cold limb and if you can see here the large ichthyomotic patch in the axilla is a giveaway most of the times when the patients come in on second or third or fourth day there is a significant ichthyosis distally distal part of the arm but this ichthyosis in the axilla was a giveaway so here you can see there is a complete block at uh, uh, subclavian and axillary vessels which had to be uh, repaired by using a, a necron graft of course we did a fasciotomy and stabilized the humerus once in a while the screw cut out also can lead to uh, injury to the vessels that's an something like an iatrogenic injury as you can see here on 12th day the humerus fixation gave way and patient bled a lot axillary artery needed to be repaired and uh, had to be re explored twice this is what was published in jbj 2007 the axillary the brachial plexus is also very near the humerus and very commonly especially while doing a coracoid osteotomy the brachial plexus is likely to get injured remember when you abduct the shoulder the brachial plexus comes very very near the coracoid and therefore the arm needs to be adducted while doing a coracoid osteotomy the importance of axillary nerve in mipo i am sure dr tirachai will discuss at length talking about the blood supply of proximal humerus it is the anastomosis between anterior and posterior circumflex humerus humeral arteries that supplies the upper end humerus now what is important is as you can see here the ascending branch of posterior humeral artery perforates the bone here and the and the ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery perforates here what is important as you can see here it is closely related to the bicipital groove and bicep long head of biceps tendon and it perforates just medial to the or at the bicipital groove so any gross dissection here putting implants here is very likely to injure the anterior uh, uh, the the ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery now there are people who say that the long head of biceps just works as a stabilizer but as far as the real action is concerned it just vestigial and therefore many surgeons do tenodesis of long head of biceps while fixing the proximal humerus and they feel that the results or function wise results are much better lastly as you can see here the trabecular pattern significantly deteriorates with osteoporosis that's the upper end humerus at 30 that's the upper end humerus at 70 though we hardly ever do dexa rather the real indicator of osteoporosis is hip but we should remember that because of osteoporosis a significant comminuted fracture can occur and the implant holding or anchorage of implants is very very poor lastly there is a concept called metaphyseal torus concept that is being introduced in the upper end humerus and you can see that it is in three three columns that support the head of humerus 
the anterior anterior lateral and posterior lateral column also called distraction zone it generally is possi fragmentary but rotator cuff function problems are common the second zone is or the column is the anterior medial column this is a tilting zone and that actually the reconstitution of this will prevent tilting of the head of the humerus it is generally posi fragmentary and because of the importance of blood supply this can lead to perfusion problems and the posterior medial column as you can see here and that's a crumple zone the generally it is the the region gets crumpled and unless reconstituted well the head of the humerus is very likely to fall down and again this will have a multi fragmentary fracture and there would be a perfusion problem because of posterior circumflex humeral artery so this friends in short are a few important points you need to remember about surgical anatomy in dealing with proximal humeral fractures thank you very much friends uh, great you. okay thanks very much vikas that was great uh, what uh, i forgot to mention in the initial part is that after the fourth talk that is tirachai's talk we'll have one round of case discussions and then we'll have the last two talks and the final round of case discussions okay so rajiv if there any yeah, yeah. you can yeah, uh, till, yeah till now there is no question as such but uh, soon after the second talk if the question comes i'll yeah. go back to dr vikas and while if uh, uh, pande you can share your yeah. screen yeah and then we can get started while the yeah so i invite dr radhakant pande from leicester uk and he'll be talking on conservative management of fracture proximal humerus great yeah yeah can you see my screen yes yeah, yeah, we can see very clearly good okay <clears throat> good morning uh, from my side i think you have good afternoon there so uh, let me talk about non operative management of proximal humerus fractures only only few years ago most of these fractures were treated non operatively we were told only about 10 to 15% of proximal humeral fractures need surgery but unfortunately that is not the trend these days there is an increasing trend to fix more and more these fractures so hopefully with this corona virus the pendulum will swing back a little because we we probably need to operate less um so that as i said the trend is increasing uh, both with surgical fixation and replacements for these fractures now i will show you this x ray which is been fixed with locking plates now all of you you will agree that is it's a reasonably well fixed proximal humeral fracture uh, the fracture has healed and it's in a reasonably good position so patient should obviously get fantastic results but that is the clinical picture of this patient as you can see the normal arm has got about 170 degrees movement and the operated arm has got only 90 degrees of movement uh, almost 9 months after surgery so what i'm trying to tell you is just because you get a good x ray uh, and the fracture heals doesn't necessarily mean that you will get a good outcome now this is another x ray of somebody with a three part fracture the tuberosity is quite uh, displaced and this patient was sent um, for surgery so i talked to him gave him various options including non operative management and he was a bit scared to have surgery so he said can i choose non operative management i said fine so he started to heal uh, in few months time and this is the movement he had as 7 months he is delighted and you can see yes there is a slight restriction of movement but i don't think you could have guaranteed him full range of movement with even putting the best plates or nails inside so for all practical purposes this guy is doing very very well i will show you some more more uh difficult cases this was a you can see the tuberosity is almost split 
Um, and you would think, why would he even think of treating this non-operatively? But this patient had a stroke only a month ago and has got certain other problems with his heart. So we talked to him at length and we were wanting to do a reverse shoulder or a hemialtoplasty. He was not keen on surgery. So we said, okay, uh, you take your chances. So, sorry. Uh, so he came back, he, we followed him, uh, him up and this is what he is at a year. Now you would think, hmm, that doesn't look quite good. But if you see the corner, this is the lady who can, an English lady who can drink her tea, eat her food and do most of her daily activities. And she's got no pain. So if you look at the initial X-ray, you were probably looking at replacing this joint. If you were doing a hemialtroplasty, I don't think you'll get better result than what you had non-operatively. And if you're going to fix this fracture, there is a reasonable chance of it failing. So non-operative management, I'm not suggesting that uh, you do it for everybody, uh, but if you choose your patient properly, you are likely to get fairly good results. Now, this is again somebody who was sent for surgery, we discussed, and this patient went on to heal. And this is the patient who is one of my happiest patients. He even brought me a bottle of single malt whiskey, which is <laughs> the best outcome measure I have known. So beware, uh, I would say, uh, surgical treatment is increasingly being used, increasing the treatment cost of shoulder fracture. And I think in these days with the coronavirus, we need to also need to think about patient safety, staff safety, and the surgeon safety. So maybe we may want to go start reading the Charlie's textbook of non-operative fracture management again. And there is a very nice Cochrane review done. Surgery for displaced fracture of the proximal humerus may not result in better outcomes than non-surgical management. So yes, we are operating a lot more, but we haven't actually shown that that has generally improved the outcomes for as a whole. I mean, for individual patients, you may definitely increase outcomes with surgery. Now, all of us have got a collection of these kind of x-rays, and John has probably got the highest number of collection of these kind of x-rays. <laughs> And you, you, you may get a one patient who you made significantly better, but most of us have amnesia when they come to uh, say, oh, therefore every one patient they are made better, they've also made one patient worse. So remember these kind of x-rays. Now I am not saying you don't operate on proximal humeral fractures at all. Now, if you have a greater tuberosity fracture, which is off, you fix it. Fracture dislocation, you fix it or replace it. Lock posterior fracture dislocation, you fix it or, or, or replace it. The very displaced fractures, you have to do something completely displaced fracture, you may have to put a plate or nail. So there is plenty of fractures in the proximal humerus which can be treated surgically. However, I'm talking about these kind of fractures. Now, if you look at these kind of fractures, you think, yeah, they are broken, they look displaced, but you'll be surprised how well the shoulder does with a bit of non-union. It, it is very, very forgiving, and the risks are min very, very small. And just because you're treating something non-operatively doesn't mean you miss the boat. You follow them up, you see whether the fracture is healing or not, whether they are progressing or not. You can change your management plan three, four weeks down the line. Uh, if need be. But all these patients I'm showing you in front of your screen here, they were all listed or, uh, or sent to us for surgery and they all treated them non-operatively with reasonably good results. So th this is another of my patients, uh, which was, I mean, this could have, everybody knows that this can be treated non-operatively. This is not very, very displaced. The tuberosity is in reasonable place. The shaft and the head are, reasonably well aligned. Why would you operate on this? This will give as good, if not better results with non-operative management than with surgery. Remember, proximal humeral fractures uh, are almost, I mean, I would say 80% soft tissue surgery and only 20% bony surgery. 
and and if you don't respect the soft tissues which can be difficult with with with, uh, with surgery you are not likely to get very good results but this is again this is the same guy he's got full range of movement post uh, non operative management this is a lady who's got a malunited so we call it or maheshwari in delhi calls it the acceptable mal malunion she is driving a car and pleased with whatever she has achieved so i'm i'm sort of touting non operative management is there any evidence now this is a huge trial and i'm, I'm sure most people would have heard of profar trial but there are some misconceptions with profar trial they seem to think profar trial tells you that you should not operate on proximal humeral fractures that's wrong profar trial is a pragmatic trial it's a randomized control trial it the people who were included in this trial were people who uh, the surgeon saw the x-ray and he was not sure whether to operate or not to operate so the ones which needed operation surgeon went ahead and did the operation the one they thought oh this can be treated non operatively they were treated non operatively but only those x rays and i'm sure all of you face this dilemma every day you look at an x ray of the proximal humerus and you're thinking oh, whether i should leave it or operate those cases if you leave them treat them non operatively they will do as well as operation i hope you get the message it is not not operate or, or only non operative it is for those cases which you felt in equipoise that means you were not sure whether to operate or not to operate and those are the ones if you treat them non operatively you will do as well so the trial results do not support the trend of increased surgery for patients with displaced proximal humeral fractures all displaced proximal humeral fractures need not be operated on so how are we going to do the non operative management and i think the most important thing is you have to actually give that option to the patient you have to say there is another option of non operative management in young patient 30 40 obviously you have to individualize those ones you are more likely to uh, sort of operate because you don't want too much malignant but whether to operate or not to operate the most important thing as i've been said earlier is the displacement and the stability of tuberosities tuberosities will decide how well your shoulder is going to do so if you have decided to treat something non operatively this is what we do here in lester we put them into a sling we take check x rays every week if required and at two weeks we start pendular exercises with an x ray and we start passive and assisted exercise at 3 weeks active exercise between 4 to 6 weeks strengthening at 3 months obviously this is not what you need to do but this is a rough guide guidelines and it all depends on your tuberosity your check x rays which you take seriously is to look at the tuberosity if the tuberosity start to move away then you need to do something and as i said young patients you may have to treat them slightly differently so this let's have an example so this is a fracture and i may ask you and i'm sure that a lot of people will say mm, that can be it should be operated on and i would beg to differ so you look at the humeral head here it's facing in the right direction this is the tuberosity yes it's comminuted but it's under the head and it's in the right position if you look at the lateral most things look roughly in the place where they should be so although the x ray looks wow that's comminuted and let me do something about it but if you look at it very very critically you can get a ct scan make sure there is no head split but if the capital fragment and the tuberosities are in roughly the place if they so the near said it should be if it is displaced more than one its fragment i don't i don't worry too much about 1 cm if it's roughly in the same place i would treat this non operatively and this is the this is at about 3 4 months this at about a year and you can see the patient's got very good range of movement and he was very very happy with what he had so uh, even if you'd done an operation i doubt if you'd guaranteed him that kind of movement and you would have put him through some risks thank you very much
Thank you. Uh, for the, uh, so while we get some questions in, so can I ask one question to Dr. Pandey? Yeah. So what is your yeah. decision on treating non-operative? What are the things that you look at at the x-ray uh, to make you think that this patient definitely needs surgery or it may be suitable for conservative management? So if we go back to this x-ray, as I said, the most important thing is where your head and tuberosity is lying. So if, even if the tuberosity is gone about a centimeter at the top, if the majority of the tuberosity is, is in the reasonable, it's not sort of pulled out and gone posteriorly significantly, one centimeter I don't think makes a difference. If it's completely off, with no contact between the shaft and humerus and the tuberosity is completely off, those ones you may want to make sure the tuberosity is brought back into place. The humeral head, again, you can take about 15 to 20 degrees uh, or even uh, 30 degrees of tilt in either way because humerus has got very good range of movement uh, and it can compensate. So it, it looks at the, the, the capital fragment, how angulated that is, how displaced this tuberosity is, and if there is no connection between the humeral shaft and these two fragments, then you may think of surgery. But if there is even 25, 30% contact between the shaft and the rest of the fragment, and most, play, most other fragments, the tuberosity and the head, are in a reasonable position, I would go for non-operative management. Yeah, that's interesting because... Uh... Yeah. And is your, is your conservatives, the sling, just a regular sling or do you have a shoulder immobilizer kind of thing? Yeah, but no, it's a poly sling. So it supports the elbow also. So at some time, or if you want to use a normal sling, then it has to be a double uh, sling so that the elbow doesn't drag down and gravity doesn't pull everything down. So okay. you, you, we support the elbow also. But okay. uh, many times we have to ask the patient Try and sleep slightly propped up position. Don't lie, lie flat. And if you okay. sit in a slightly propped up position, they are more comfortable. Yeah, so uh, Rajiv, any questions? Yeah, yeah it's uh, extension to your question itself, that uh, the same question being asked, like whether the sling or immobilizer, and how many weeks? Is it two weeks or three weeks? Because the standard teaching is for us is that it glues in three weeks. No, no, no. Any there is no teaching like that anywhere. I have read extensively about these things. Everybody has got opinions about these things. Sometimes if you see a, like I'll show you an x-ray. Uh, I'll just show you. This one, we mobilized immediately. We did not put them, we put them in a sling, but I had advised him to take the sling, sling out every day and start gentle mobilization as he could. Whereas if you get somebody like this, maybe you want to keep them in a sling for a week or two. But what you don't want to do is to put them in a sling for long periods of time. Remember, there's a lot of soft tissue there. Two weeks maximum after that, they must start moving to a certain degree. How much they move, it will all depend on how bad the fractures are. Yeah, and the other thing that you do notice is just putting them in a sling sometimes over a period of time actually does reduce the fracture to some extent. Yeah. Uh, that's very important point I, I should have said. Uh, if you look at the first x-ray after the injury, immediate uh, trauma x-ray, that always looks bad. If you ex do the same shoulder a week later, in which the patient can bring the arm in neutral position, not internal rotated or external rotating, the x-ray always looks a lot better. And if you do a CT scan, don't willy-nilly do CT scans for everybody. Uh, you need to know why you're doing the CT scan because CT scan always looks worse than the X-ray. Yeah. So you, you just be careful when you do CT scan. You need to know why you want to do the CT scan. And I would do CT scan if you want to see a head split. If you are seeing the greater tuberosity is split or commuted, those are the two main reasons. And sometimes you want to see if there are there, there is a there is significant displacement of the fragments or not, which you can do most of the time with two views. Always do two views for a shoulder injury. Great. Yeah, one more question from uh, Indore. Dr. Saket has asked, like, is there be any role in geriatric patient of denoxumab 
or teriparatide along with uh, conservative management do you prescribe uh, denoximab or uh, teriparatide i'm really sorry i don't know what those two are <clears throat> teriparatide is parathyroid hormone uh, for osteoporosis basically but... for the osteoporotic fractures in the geriatric patient he has asked whether we should give teriparatide or denoximab which is a parathyroid i think i think uh, I mean, we are slightly different here in nhs if we think patient has got an osteoporotic fracture we send them to uh, the okay. metabolic bone disease people and they do everything and they treat them properly i i think this uh, small uh, treatment for osteoporosis can be a bit dangerous because you need to know what osteoporosis is and it has to be a prolonged treatment if you give patients for 2 3 weeks whatever you want to i don't think it makes a huge difference if the patient has got osteoporosis that has to be treated properly they may have need a dexa scan and then go for treatment so i we don't generally give uh, the parathormone or this thing but if you feel that there is osteoporosis involved yes it is treated properly yeah i think so Thanks. the uh, parathyroid hormone uh, especially teriparatide is being misused a lot as something that helps fractures heal uh, it's a treatment for osteoporosis yes <clears throat> uh, but i don't think it should be assumed that it helps a fracture to heal yes so i think uh, thank you very dr. much pandey. dr yeah. pande yeah actually this is not a question i will support you and your views and there are many articles and there are many literature in the literature and they support your views and uh, sometimes they mention uh, there's a cm score as high as 72 so i think this has to be uh, considered as a modality yes. of treatment not okay yet. so i think vikas you can start sharing your screen yeah sure yeah yeah so once you have decided that you are going to do open reduction and internal fixation put it on full screen vikash yeah, yeah great right. uh, how do we proceed whether to operate or not whether to do open reduction or not is not what i am going to discuss it's only after you have decided that you are going to do open reduction finally what are the aims of any shoulder surgeon activities of daily living most important is activity is daily living you need good range of movement good abduction adduction good rotations especially for eating uh, combing your uh, hair and toilet activities and of course uh, in some cases you need some extraordinary actions we keep talking of uh, various implants you attend any workshop or symposium the first thing that comes to your mind or the first thing that is taught is whether you would do a plating or a nailing which company what length which screws where or which nail which generation so on and so forth how to expose the fracture how to expose for implant insertion and of course avoid implant related complications and we come back with a, a lot of material as related to this and the first thing we do is yes i mean when you have a fracture dislocation like this anterior fracture dislocation you can see the you are able to do uh, appropriate open reduction and internal fixation as you can see here the plate applied properly the position of the plate is fantastic the angulation the normal uh, humerus is almost reconstituted and the fracture is healed well and the patient has got excellent result the uh, one fantastic paper by uh, ashok gavaskar uh, outlines this commonly used implant that second generation lock plating for complex 
proximal humerus. And he, the, the authors describe that you should have seven locking head screws, including two calcar screws, augmented with traction cuff sutures. The comminated, in case the medial calcar is comminated, you need to have an industrial fibular strut. And for a subchondral metaphyseal bone defect, it has to be filled with injectable calcium phosphate cement. And this is how they have described this. And the results have been very, very good functionally also. So when we talk of principles of open reduction and internal fixation, yes, these are extremely important. But what is not often discussed is the software. And that is getting reduction, how to get reduction, how to get stable reduction, in severe osteoporosis, how to improve the stability of reduction and purchase of reduction. And most important, how to prevent fibrosities flying off. So as I discussed in anatomy, this is a torus concept now. And you can consider the head of the humerus is supported by a three-legged stool. You can see the head of humerus is already slanting. So this three-legged stool plays an extremely important role in supporting the head of the humerus. So the aim is to reconstitute this three-legged stool. And fracture reduction, we can use spikes, K-wires, joysticks, so on and so forth. The first step, of course, is doing a CT. I would like to know whether the head is split. I would like to know whether there's a combination, I would like to know where are the tuberosities and whether they are combinated also. So that's the glenoid. I would like to know whether there's a head split and I would like to know what are the different ways of or different types of head split. You could have a main posterior fracture line. You could have an anterior fracture line. You can find out uh, with the CT whether there is a central area which is coming which is uh, articulating with the glenoid but there is an anterior fracture line and there is a posterior fracture line or whether there is a head which is just burst into several pieces so if there is a head split you need to plan how you are going to reduce the head split and then how you are going to reconstitute this three legged stool So in a three or four part fracture, putting back the head can be done or addressing the head can be done through the rotator interval. As you can see here, the rotators are already split or they are separated. And then you can address the head of the humerus through this rotator interval and reconstitute the medial hinge, reconstitute the head on the medial hinge, a temporary K wire can be inserted. Then the lateral cortex can be reconstituted. Here you can see the lateral cortex is restored or the greater tuberosity is restored. You still have the anterior or the lesser tuberosity away through which you can keep seeing the reduction. And then at the end, the lesser tuberosity is reconstituted or put back into position. As, a, as I said, K wires, uh, joysticks can be used or uh, spikes can be used to take the head. The most important thing is see to it that velocities don't fly off because the rotator and they remain stable. The head has to be stabilized by the rotators. So here you can see the three rotators uh, attached to the greater tuberosity. That's the rotator attached to the lesser tuberosity. That's the subscapularis. So once the medial hinge is reconstituted, or even before that, one can take sutures through the through the rotators. You could use a five number ethy bond for taking sutures or pull out sutures through the tuberosities and pull them down. 
Once tuberosities are pulled down, the sutures can be passed through the head as well as the shaft to get a semblance of anatomical reduction of the head. Then this can be maintained by one or two K wires. And the most important, the sutures can be passed through the plate or holes of the plate. They are passed before the plate is seated and fixed, but they are tied only after the plate is fixed to the shaft. And of course, we know most of us operate in beach chair position, use a deltopectoral incision. The incision is an internervous plane. Now there are some drawbacks of uh, deltopectoral incision. The large deltoid is a large, large muscle. Getting the post posteriorly displaced greater tuberosity. Most often the greater tuberosity is shifted posteriorly. Getting posteriorly displaced greater tuberosity becomes little difficult. You need to abduct, externally rotate and hook the greater tuberosity under the deltoid and stabilize it. Also application of plate also needs a uh, decent retraction of deltoid so that the plate is seated appropriately. But of course, it is a major workhorse. Major, uh, most often used an uh, incision is the uh, is the uh, deltopectoral incision. One thing I forgot to mention: the long head of biceps works as a lighthouse. Long head of biceps works as a lighthouse and you uh, it takes you between the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity and they can be brought together. The most commonly used implant is the lock plate which offers angular stability and as you can see the screws are divergent and convergent. It's a combination of uh, screws in various directions so as to give maximum purchase in osteoporotic bone. Now as regards plate is concerned, you need to consider the plate positioning so that there is no restriction on movements. The plate should be optimally placed so as to have optimal direction of the screws and the calcar screws are also appropriately placed. So generally, the plate position needs to be about 8 millimeters below the greater tuberosity. One could use the, the block and the, a small K wire of 1, 1 1.2 millimeters is passed like this and confirm that it is just touching the upper part of the head of the humerus. This gives you a proper position for the locked posterior plate, a locked uh, proximal humerus plate. From the bicepital tuberosity, it should be about 8 to 10 millimeters away so that it is placed right in the center of the greater tuberosity. It should be about 8 millimeters caudal to the greater tuberosity so that there is no impingement during abduction. Now, as regards screws are concerned, proximally we need to have maximum number of screws. The length of the screw should be such that they're about eight to 10 millimeters away from the subchondral bone. One should see to it that there is no penetration of the screws. And for optimizing purchase, one could use calcium phosphate cement. Distally using the screws, one should be careful that you don't use a cortical or a non-locking screw here because otherwise there would be a secondary displacement after you have already achieved the reduction. Distally avoid putting a lock screw because otherwise chances of stress risers are very high. Now placing the calcar screws. Uh, this paper suggests this uh, experimental study but it is best they to what they say is avoid missing high. Don't miss high in the sense the plate can be little distal. Plate should not be too proximal. 
to have an appropriate purchase. So just to run through some cases, here you can see this is a young patient who has a valgus impacted fracture. You can see the tuberosities are markedly displaced. The, that's a neck which is into valgus stable, but the tuberosities are markedly displaced and this would definitely lead to impingement. So one has to really plan this well. Here you can see there's a valgus impacted fracture. Tuberosities are riding high. So the aim is to lift the, tuberos lift the head between the tuberosities, support the head like eggshell, realign the tuberosities and fix. So go between the tuberosities, lift the head, support the head, create the medial buttress well, close the tuberosities, take sutures, fix the lesser tuberosity to the head so that close this container. As you can see, the container was split. The head was in valgus. So the head position, the egg position is maintained. The container is appropriately reduced and stabilized. And this is immediate post-op. Here you can see the uh, tuberosities and that's range of movement, range of movement extremely happy patient. Sometimes you have a very challenging situation, markedly displaced head of humerus in a patient who has multiple other problems, markedly restricted shoulder movement. And here you can see the patient also has significant osteoporosis. So here the aim is stabilize, but achieve a stable reduction. That means shove the distal fragment into proximal fragment so that you have a good stable reduction and then go back patient has got back whatever range of movement she already had pre-treatment also she had markedly restricted movement we have gone back to that with a very good stable reduction so in an osteoporotic patient aim for a collapse aim for docking a distal fragment into proximal fragment and then getting a stable reduction. Sometimes the osteoporosis can be very, very significant. As you can see here, this is, you can see a very severe osteoporosis. So you need to have a good reconstitution of the proximal as well as distal fragment. And here a femoral head allograft is used. As you can see, femoral head allograft is used that is put inside. So that's the patient's head. That's the femoral allograft, which is temporarily stabilized. And that gave a very good stable reduction and which is now supported by proximal humerus locking plate. And that's intraoperative and that's postoperative. Now, what is important is addressing virus. Avoid virus. One can have a very good result. The screw penetration needs to be avoided. If virus is avoided, screw penetration is avoided. The screw penetration can be early, that is during surgery, or screw penetration can be late, that is with virus collapse. So this virus collapse is common or screw penetration is common in four part fracture, C type of fracture or whenever there is medial hinge disruption. So one has to avoid virus collapse. See to it that the C arm is taken in various views so as to prevent, avoid penetration on table. Coming to nailing, uh, the new nail or third generation nail is a pretty good option for part two fractures or uh, two part fracture as you can see here. The difference between the earlier nailing where the nail was put through the rotator cuff is now the nail is put through the center of the head 
passing through the through the muscle of supraspinatus so as to avoid cuff problems as you can see here and this is a very promising option the uh, displacement is considered into or there are three different types of displacement and that has to be taken into consideration while reduction and a pretty good result can be obtained in a markedly displaced osteoporotic fracture also use of a uh, same nail in type 3 and type 4 fractures was tried and reported in this series and they had a revision rate of almost 30% and there is a significant incidence of collapse and proximal migration of nail in type 3 and uh, 3 and 4 part fractures so it is possibly probably safer to avoid use of this nail in type uh, in uh, part 3 rather uh, three part and four part fractures so to summarize friends principles of orif good imaging good pre op planning appropriate patient positioning and surgical approach anatomical reduction achieving stable reduction is the most important thing there is no harm in docking there is no harm in collapsing people have in fact created an osteotomy and put the distal part into proximal part <clears throat> getting stable reduction is very very important reduction and stabilization of tuberosities plays a very major role implant choice you could use a plate or a nail that is your your choice if you are using a plate medial calcal screws play a very major role augmentation of uh, in an osteoporotic bone sub, with a graft is very very important and of course early mobilization and look for avn plays a major role thank you friends uh, thanks rikash uh, uh, rajiv any questions while uh, yeah. hira chai yeah, can share his, share his screen in the meanwhile yeah, one question was asked from the postgraduate student that uh, in valgus impacted fracture, uh, in a three-part fracture, if you are fixing it, how to uh, prevent axillary nerve damage? Uh, you are talking of, I think the person is talking about doing MIPO. Am I right? Uh, possibly he is talking of doing MIPO, which of course will be discussed by Dr. Thirachai, but the the rule is avoid splitting the uh, deltoid beyond about 4.5 centimeters, then keep a decent wad of muscle, uh, a decent wad of soft tissues of at least a centimeter or so, put a finger along the, the head of the femur, palpate the axillary nerve, go beyond that and then make another another cut which i am sure dr Thirchai will discuss this at length i generally do a delto pectoral incision and then chances of axillary nerve damage are minimal yeah that's it okay Thirchai, you ready Thirchai, you ready yeah can you hear me yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay now yeah yeah good. okay yes good afternoon yeah thanks john for inviting me to share again my experience of the mipo of the proximal humerus okay the objective of this talk the first is the selection of the patients what is the indication in the past we tried to do everything with mipo yeah, but now sometimes it needs to look and step back what we can do, what we cannot do with the MIPO techniques. I show you the surgical approach, what is the structure at least, how to reduce, and fixation that's already mentioned by the because of the, the, the fillers. Yeah, for the indication. Two parts of the proximal humerus, yeah, and maximum for me now is the three parts fractures, especially if you have uh, GT, greater tuberosity fractures, and the head and the shaft 
this is good indication because you already on the lateral part of the proximal humerus. The proximal humerus with the shaft extension, yeah, maybe with our uh, without comminution of the, the, the head. Four parts for me now is too difficult to reduce, especially if you have the displaced lesser tuberosities because it's on the anterior and your incision is on the lateral. It's very difficult to fix or to re sutures the cap, cup sutures to reduce this fracture. So choose the right patient, then it will be easy for you and very impressed for this uh, type of fixation. Okay, just have a look. This is the proximal humerus fractures, right? The patient has a multiple injury, 29 years old. How many fragments? Yeah, maybe you cannot see it well, but if you look carefully with the CT scan, yeah, if you look, you still have a big head fragment here. You see my arrow, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you look from the lateral, yeah, you can see this is a GT. Yeah, even you see many fragments of the head and the shaft strat scatter, but the head and the GT is not that bad. Yeah, so if you can restore this anatomical position, then maybe you just bypass this comminuted zone. Okay, now I think this is no choice. Everybody should agree that this is an operative case. Yeah, conservative maybe, but yeah, you get a very stiff shoulders because of this uh, comminution. Yeah, as I tell you, if you look carefully, if you can fix the head and you bypass the comminuted proximal shaft, then it should be possible to do this uh, MIPO. Okay, the position is depend, whatever you want. You can do the, you can do the B chair or this is another option. You can swing the C-arm AP and lateral without moving the, the arm of the patients. It depends on the surgeon preference. Yeah, if you look at this anatomy and the published article of the danger zone for axillary nerve when you do the MIPO of the proximal humerus by using the philos. Yeah, if you look carefully, this block is the area. Yeah, we call the danger zone. Oops, sorry. This is a danger zone. If you look at the anatomical studies, you can fix only one, two, three, four, five, six hole. Yeah, if you're going down, yeah, this is the axillary nerve that you may hit it. Yeah, so six screws on the proximal if you do the MIPO. Okay, supine. Yeah, I always draw the acromion, draw the incision and the axillary nerve. Then the first starter, this is important. You go down on the bone, you see the uh, bursa. Then you perforate, you open the bursa, trying to find the road of the cuff. The first sutures, you may not get a very good bite of the rotator cuff or the supraspinatus, but then you make a sutures and then you pull it down, then you can find or can see where is the good position of the cuff sutures that you have to do. Now, this is in, in a cadaver specimen. Yeah, you see, after you open this deltoid split approach, you will see the bursa. You have to perforate the bursa. I mark this in red, it's important. On the bone, that means you have to open the bursa. You have to find the bone and then you make a tunnel, go under the X-ray nerve. If you see the bursa and then you start to prepare the tunnel, then you will be over the X-ray nerve. This is the key of uh, after somebody asks this uh, before this talk. Yeah, be careful. Walk on the bone always. Yeah, and the axillary nerve is around, we always said 4.5 or 5 centimeters below the acromion process. Yeah, 
and the nerve. If you relax the deltoid, that means you abduct the shoulder, then the axillary nerve will be released from the bone. Then you can lift it up with your fingers. Okay, just show you the diagram. After you can reduce, you reduce it. Yeah, you can pass your fingers. You feel this axillary nerve bundle. Yeah, you're going down. If you want to find it more prominent, you go on the back of the shoulder because the axillary nerve is bigger on the posterior than the anterior on the lateral. Yeah, always use these fingers to find. Yeah. The diagram will show you your fingers. If you walk on the bone, then your fingers will lift up the axillary nerve. Now, we have to go to the distal incision. Yeah. You have to find the radial nerve because this is really far down. Yeah. If you do the, just a two part, it's okay. But if you want to go down, you have to find the radial nerve which lie between the brachialis and the brachioladialis. And then you make a tunnel. You can bypass the bridging comminuted fracture zone and the plate will lie on the anterolateral surface, lie flat on the anterolateral surface of the distal humerus and lie on the greater tuberosity on the proximal humerus. Most of the case, the rotation should be okay. Yeah. You have to find the radial nerve. Yeah. If you look, this is the plate. When you slide the plate down, you find the nerve yeah, and cook it and you will see this is the plate, which is more anterior to the radial nerve. The pitfall, don't use the home mine retractors. I always said, when you make a distal incision, use the armory amine retractors because the tip of the home man can compress on the radial nerve. Just only once, then you will have a wrist drop. Okay, now make a tunnel. This is also important. When you want to make the tunnel from the proximal to the distal, yeah, you have to perforate the deltoid insertion. This is a very tight fibers ad adhere to the bone. It's very important. If you make a right tunnel, then the plate can go down and go in the correct direction. So you have to make a, like an anatomical position, supination of the forearm, and then you make the tunnel straight. If you rotate the, the forearm, internal or external, rotate of the forearm, the distal will rotate. Then you make the tunnel. Then the tunnel will not in the correct tunnel. And then when you slide the plate down, you have the hole, the wrong hole in the deltoid insertion. And then when you want to fix it, you may create the malrotation between the proximal and the distal fragment. Okay, let's look. Check the AP X-ray. When you make a cup suture, you can see the head is in the, its position, but you can control this head fragment by the sutures, cup suture and then you manipulate, right? Now it look not that bad with this uh, position, right? Then you fix the head and the shaft, uh, the head and the GT, you check the X-ray. Now it's like anatomical position with the plate and the head. And then you check the lateral X-ray. Right now, the proximal fragment and the, the plate is almost like a normal position. So this is a very really comminuted fracture. You just bypass it going down in the correct position in the distal part, and then you temporarily fix with the K wipes. Right? And this is the final fixation, proximal and distal. Yeah, you will see the gap at this uh, common death fracture zone. You can make a little bit shortening of this humerus because one centimeter, it doesn't matter for the humerus shortening. Eight weeks, 10 months. Yeah, the range of motion is 
acceptable and you see this breaching callus without the bone graft. Okay, now this is another case of 78 years old, three parts fractures. Yeah. This is a case that you can fix with the MIPO technique. Again, I show you the deltoid strip. Now you see the bursa. Don't make a tunnel. You have to open this bursa on the bone until you see the lateral cortex of the GT. And sometimes you see the rotator cuff supraspinatus on the top here. Yeah. Then you palpate the axillary nerve. Abduct the shoulder slightly. And then you make the position. Yeah, sutures, cup suture. You mark the position. Where is the distal part of the plate? The axillary nerve should be around here, right? So we bypass, just make this so incision here. Now, detach the deltoid. Important. You have to detach the deltoid insertion from above or from below. And then you use your fingers to repair the tunnel. This tunnel is under, yeah, the axillary nerve is under your finger, uh, over your fingers. Now you can make this tunnel. Okay, show you how to reduce. You can use the bone hook. You, you have the cup sutures. Yeah, I try to do use the bone hook to hook it first to correct this virus of the head. And now you see it's not that bad. And then you pull this cup sutures. You can maintain the position of this head into the normal alignment. Yeah, again, or you can use this joystick between the GT and the head, and then you leverage it down. Now you correct the virus, right? And now you reduce, take major deforming force by using this uh, hammer. Then you pinning. The KY should be from the top down to the shaft. Don't fix it from the lateral to the head because you will obstruct the plate later, right? And then you prepare this tunnel, as I showed you before. Yeah, you slide the plate in. You fix to check with the X-ray, right? Use the normal screw to push the to pull the plate, like a reduction tool. Right, six screws is enough. Okay, this is the intraoperative. As you can see the first, the head is in virus. Yeah, and now after the cup sutures and pull it, yeah, this is the label edge, the KYs in the head. Now you see the KYs between these two pictures. Yeah, after you level it, now you reduce almost perfect. You look at the cow car here, right? Now it's almost anatomical post reduction. Yeah, and then you're pinning from the top down to the proximal medial shaft. And this is the final fixation. Post up five months. You see, there's still some limitation of the internal rotation. Yeah, in the elderly, most of the cases limit internal rotation, but she can work, yeah, but not 100% of the perfect uh, function. So in summary, I will choose the two parts, three parts, or the common root proximal shaft for the proximal humerus mepo. The structure and list, I show you the axial nerve on the proximal and the distal. If you're going down, far down, then you have to find the radial nerve. However, I will tell you, you need the experience with the open deltopectoral approach first. You have to know where to put the plate in the correct position, how to look at the X-ray, AP, and lateral view intraoperatively. Then you can make this MIPO is possible. But the last one, don't forget, Elderly, low demand, osteoporosis, and adoption should be conservative treatment. Thank you very much. Dear uh, that was great. Uh, do we have any questions, Rajiv? 
Yeah, questions again. They have asked uh, about the same axillary nerve. I yeah. think it's a learning curve. Uh, Dr. Tirachai will explain, like which uh, position uh, we should spare not to put the screws. Exactly, what is the landmark in which he avoid putting screws? Dr. Tirachai. Yeah, I think I already showed you, right? Yeah. You can fix only six screws. That's the most important. And use your fingers to protect the axillary nerve before you slide the plate in. Yeah. And that's that's the best way to, to make the abduction the shoulder. Yeah. Abduction the shoulder. And then you have more space to put your index fingers under the axillary nerve. Yeah, I think uh, you have to be able to feel the axillary nerve with your finger. And yep. uh, the calca screws may be a bit difficult to put in. And you can't put in the, uh, the jig that you have with the philos because it's a bit too big to put in through the MIPO approach. So there's another jig for the MIPO approach, but otherwise you do it without the jig. Yeah? yeah with, with the jig, is not... The normal check is not possible. Exactly. It's with, the, with the one we just show before, we call it a guiding block. Yeah, yeah. That one will hit the axillary nerve. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you cannot use it. And the cow car screw, that's why I said it's very difficult. If you want to make a cow car screw, you have to open it down, identify yeah. the axillary nerve, and then you can put the cow car screws. So if you're so, really worried or you're not being able to feel the axillary nerve, then it might make sense to extend your incision and actually identify the axillary nerve. Yeah, now in some uh, surgeon, they prefer to do what they call the anterolateral approach. Anterolateral That's approach. going down and find the axillary nerve. This is the another yeah. approach that on the Anterol lateral surface. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, yeah. we will start some of the case discussions. So, uh, uh, Pandey, you want to uh, load your first case and then we'll have Hirachai's and then mine, yeah? Okay. Uh, and if there are any questions in between, Rajiv, please go ahead and yeah. any difficulty you want to yeah, ask I'll... as well, yeah? Ashish, you got anything? Yeah, yeah I'm keeping a watch. So are you sharing your screen, Pandey? Uh, just one second. Um, so while uh, Pandey is trying to get his yeah. screen, so Tirach, the deltoid insertion, uh, there are two ways. You said you release it. The other uh, way is to actually go through the V of the insertion, right through the middle. Have you tried that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you have to make the, the, the arm in the collect position. The, the yeah. elbow should be anatomical position. And then you, when you make a tunnel from the top down, the delta is the V shape. Yeah, it usually is go down to the top of the, the, the triangle. Yeah. Yeah, but try to make it a little bit bigger. Okay. You put your screen. You want to show your case? You want to show? I show my case now. Yeah, you no. could show your case and then uh, meanwhile. Can see, can, John, can you see my screen? Right yeah, now, we're on the child's screen on. No, that is my no, screen. No, I think it's okay. That's your because screen. Okay, fine, great. Pandey okay. already show it. Okay. Okay, so uh, Pandey, carry on then. Yeah. So this is a sixty-six-year-old pretty fit and healthy lady, plays golf. She's had a fall. And that is the x-ray we have of her, which is, uh, if you just look at the x-ray, it's uh, almost a four part displaced uh, proximal humeral fracture. The tuberosity is committed. There is a lesser tuberosity and the head is sort of in valgus impaction. Can I quickly ask the, some of the panelists as to what they will do for this? Yeah, definitely. John, Please. John, what would you do? Okay, so... Uh, the head this, is not split. Okay, so this would be one where I would really uh, worry about how I would fix it if I had to. So I would 
discuss it with the patient uh, because um, you have the choice of, because if you wanted to fix it, you'd have to reduce that impaction and you'd have a very small head fragment. And then getting it to, uh, getting good fixation on it might be difficult. So I would uh, consider both options, but talk to the patient and maybe try to convince her for conservative treatment, yeah. Okay, uh, Ashish, do you? Yeah, I think this is one of those proper cases where you could yeah. go both ways and I would sit down and talk to the patient. The pros mm -hmm. and cons uh, of both options are... It, what will you fix it with? Yeah, I would play this uh, for sure. If I do really go in, my biggest concern is the tuberosity mm -hmm. fragments, there are multiple of them. Mm -hmm. And in order to get them good rotations, I would uh, want to ensure that the GT goes back into its original place, both the GT and the LT. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Tirachai, what would you do? Yeah, I will fix it. Because fix it with what, sorry? Head, the head is rotation almost 90 degrees. Yeah. What right? will you fix it with? Plating. Plating, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Vikas, what would you do? Yeah, I would. As, is, as everybody has said, we will discuss with the patient. Finally, in our country, patients say, you decide, doctor, what is to be done. Yeah. So I would I would open reduce with a deltopectoral approach, try and get uh, tuberosities properly, lift the head, will possibly put some bone graft, either yep. patient fibula yeah, or allograft is available. Because I'm sure yeah. once I lift it up, there will be just an eggshell. So I'll support it and with a plate. Uh, maybe after today's your presentation, I, I start conserving these fractures. But at least before, as of now, I'll fix this. Yeah. So, uh, Ashish, Pandey, after this presentation, then you'll replace everything. Pande, would you uh, would you think of something like the resh technique in some in a case like yeah, this? Yeah. So I was just coming to to that. So I gave the choice to the patient, not because uh, I knew in my heart that this is not exactly the best case for non-operative management. Yeah. But I thought it is so difficult. I was thinking of replacing it, doing either a reverse shoulder or a hemiarthroplasty. But I thought the patient was quite young. Yeah. Uh, a fixation is an option. It's always an option. But I was a bit worried about the size of the head, as John, you rightly pointed out. So I gave the choice to the patient and he said, do you really think you can treat this without surgery? But I said, I'm not so sure. It, is, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? He said, yeah, it looks very bad to me. So what do you think? So I said, okay, let's do something. So initially we thought we'll replace it. But then as I'm getting older and I'm thinking, oh, I got a bit cocky and I did this. So yeah. I did the rest technique. Yeah. And I thought I got a reasonable head and the tuberosity is underneath the head and it's in the right place. Uh, and after about six, seven months, the fracture healed. So I thought, well, I've done brilliantly there. And I was even more cocky and I showed really these uh, couple of x-rays in conferences and showed my friend how brilliant I have become. So everything was going very well. Uh, but this patient, the problem in NHS is they always come back to you for follow-up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this they, is not the classical RESH technique, though. You no, have it is not classical RESH technique, but this yeah. is the technique which I have developed over the yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, and we have published this in JBJS and now yeah. in your shoulder and elbow also. So this is the, this is the most important screw because it yeah. provides the buttress for the head and keeps the tuberosity where it should belong. And then everything has got mm -hmm. some hold. So everything, uh, you can mobilize them at about two to three weeks, but not immediately, but gentle mobilization. And yeah, I was very pleased as to what has happened. So he, as, as somebody has said that nothing spoils your results than a good long follow-up. So this patient came back at about 18 months to me saying, Doc, it's uh, my shoulder is getting worse and I'm getting some pain now. So... This is the x-ray uh, I had. We did an x-ray and we did that and we thought, oh, the head is slowly disappearing. So I thought maybe his restricted movement is there. So I removed these two screws because they thought they're backing out. And this is a good thing about this technique is that screws back out rather than go into the joint. So I could take them out under local anesthetic 
but then it continued and it continued and then you see it's uh, completely destroyed and uh, the 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 uh, the screws are in there so now i'm left with very little choice uh, and then i had to go and do a reverse show dark plastic because uh, this is what i had i wanted to do in the first place but i had to do it maybe so i bought about 4 or 5 years but you see the most important thing here i'm sure ashish will turn out turn because there's no bone left i still could get some of the rotator cuff and attach it around the prosthesis so my uh, the message of this is that uh, management decisions have to be very good uh, just because you are good at one technique doesn't necessarily mean you can apply that to every case and in this case a proper evaluation of the fracture was extremely important and if you look at the ct scan the head is very small the tuberosities are almost shattered and there is a big medial gap so the blood supply to the head was very poor so now even if you did a plating uh, a bit bone graft i don't know whether you would have salvaged that head in the long run or not so sometimes the initial operation is extremely important however well it's done if you don't evaluate the fracture and assess whether this head will survive or not you may end up in a bigger trouble okay great so uh, should we have tirachai's case on yeah yeah tirachai you ready with it and any questions in the meanwhile we can keep uh, taking on yeah yeah one question to dr pandey yeah yeah one question to dr Please. pandey that can can we would have uh, fixed with uh, k wire spur cutaneous k wire fixation no i have given up k wires because oh. i put the k wires initially to reduce everything yeah. but i substitute these i substitute them with cannulated screws so those i put cannulated screws and take the wires out wires sticking out of the deltoid and skin is not good you get infection a lot of fibrosis and you lose a lot of movement and the wires migrate uh, screws migrate too but wires migrate more so i will put the wires but before i come out i substitute them with cannulated screws and then take the wires out and the screws get a better hold than wires in my opinion and they are easily removable in the late later on and i can mobilize them at 3 weeks i don't mobilize them immediately because this is not rigid fixation so you mobilize them at 3 weeks gently and then yeah. gradually increase but don't leave wires I, i i think they they cause more harm than good right okay so tirachai yeah okay a short case yeah this is a 78 years old female just the simple fall this is the first x ray yeah and what is the treatment option for this case okay may I ask I would the treat this one non operatively here yeah <laughs> 78 year old i think the tuberosity is in a reasonable place the head is slightly tilted so the shaft is everything is nearly not bad i would treat this non operatively or at least give the choice strongly to the patient in a study see the gap is shifting on the medial yeah so anyone else uh, what about uh, 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 ashish yeah as i said it's the tuberosity is that win matches if the tuberosity is there it's unharmed that means her cuff structure is good and at 78 you should give her that option but i would monitor her very closely yeah. yes, so absolutely. if i monitor the patients i would do x rays every week uh, for the next 3 to 4 weeks absolutely yeah. would you fix that yeah i'll i'll also conserve i mean is this a true chance of this is post no, talk <laughs> even prior to his talk i think i would i would conserve <laughs> okay good yeah Okay, yeah, now the follow-up is a one-week follow-up. Do you change your mind? No, this is Holding looking on. good. It's looking good. Holding on, yeah. Mm -hmm. The lateral looks good. Lateral looks very good. And even yeah. here, there seems to be a uh, good. Uh, yeah. It is sitting quite well. Yeah, it seems so to hopefully... be. Hopefully, <laughs> the contact surface is around forty percent now. Is okay. Yeah. 
Forty percent. Which which surface are we talking, Doctor Terje? The, the the contact surface of the fracture between the proximal and the distal. I would say it's a bit it's more, more than, than more than for more than forty percent. Also, the, the whole arm is slightly internally rotated. So, what I guess in the AP, that's uh, close to maybe 40, 50 percent. Yeah, if it, if you just look at the AP X-ray, but that may be deceptive. Hmm. Yeah, if, if you look carefully, the the diagnosis of this case is uh, there are two type of this. Uh, so, uh, right. In this case, the head is in vulgar's position. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's makes a difference. Yeah. yeah, and the GT is below the head. This is this is the the, the important configuration of this fracture type. Okay, I show you more conservative treatment. Yeah, <coughs> and this is two weeks now. So it's reduced to some extent just by gravity. Yeah. If it is in this position at three weeks, it means it's a stable configuration. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, okay. I show you more. Now it's three months. Mm. <laughs> Great. How oh, you can make it better than this? No, you cannot. Even with MEPO technique, you won't get better than this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> because so this, because this does the spontaneous reduction. If you have the Walker's three-part fractures, because the head tends to be moved in virus, right? And it's automatic reduction, we call it spontaneous reduction. So I think it's, this is a good option for conservative treatment. And I show you the, the result. Yeah, from this first X-ray and the three months X-ray, yeah, this is the head is moved a little bit down and the shaft is varus. The head is goes slightly varus, so it's like compensation to to normal position. And Dr. Chai, can I just ask you when did you start mobilizing this patient? Yeah. Uh, as your I I do like your 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 recommendation or your your program. Yeah, around two weeks, I start pendulum with the sling. Yeah, three weeks, 90 degree of abduction because the, the fracture now is like a sticky a little bit. Yeah. So, but that's passive abduction or active abduction? It's a passive abduction. Passive abduction, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is a function at five months. Wow. Yeah, you so can't I it broken. Nobody can do it better than Absolutely. this. Uh, so, so they, don't forget your root of the treatment. Huh? Exactly. I think this is something which is important to bring out that many of these fractures can be managed conservatively. Yeah. Especially yeah. With, yeah, AC, as they say, after Corona. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great, Tirachai. Okay. So, thank you. I'll do my case now. Uh, have you yes. off? You stop sharing? Yes. Okay, so I'll put mine. See, hopefully, that's there. No, this is not the one. Sorry. One second. I'm gonna have to go to my file. So in the meantime, the, what the Tirachai presented his case, uh, there is one question from Gerald Gonsalves uh, that uh, please explain how you managed to avoid the radial nerve distally to Dr. Tirachai in his MIFO technique presentation. Yeah, yeah. You mean the distal part, right? Yeah. yeah. How, you, how you avoid radial nerve? You, you have to find it in the distal. Yeah. You have to find the nerve and between the brachialis and the brachialis, it's like you explore the radial nerve in the lateral of the arm on the distal part. Right. You have no choice. In the past, I do with the anterior approach. Don't try to see the radial nerve. But I make a, I make a, uh, 
brake release speed in the distal part and then I pull the brake release down. But the problem is the muscle trying to push the plate to the anterior, right? And it's very right. difficult to fix in the correct position. So now if I want to go down in the distal humerus incision, I find the radial nerve and then it's easy to retract the nerve to the posterior, you retract the muscle to the anterior and then you find the bone. Yeah, more easy. Yeah. Right. Okay, so okay, I think- Thank I, you, thank you, sir. So, yeah. Can you see the- uh, Go ahead. Okay, so this is yeah, a old gentleman who uh, interestingly- You may full screen this, you may full screen. Yeah, is it full screen? No, 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 no it isn't. It isn't? Well, it's full screen on my. So go to slideshow, sir. Go to slideshow. Slide, go to slideshow. Slideshow. There's no slideshow. On the top, sir. Besides animation, you have slideshow. I don't have animation here. While home and again, transition, transition slideshow. Let me, let me cut it. Switch the top menu, you can see that, sir. Where? Or the choose the video. bottom toolbar as well. Yeah, as well. Can you see the bottom toolbar? There are four, yeah. four, five icons there. Yeah, let me just first optimize this one. Now, which one do I resume? Oh, yeah. I'll put the second slide, sir. So on the bottom right, you have this here. Which one? No, John, this is not working. Go no, back. No, Go back. I sir. think I have to uh, stop share and start again. One second. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, I would need to shut off that one extra presentation. Open the file first, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's so it's open. I just okay. So that's open now. And then and then share the slide. Just give me a minute. You can take some more questions in the meanwhile. Right. So, uh, a question to Dr. Agase that you that you please explain the three pillars which you have said, whether it is the uh, GT, LT, and Calcar. So, three legs you have said. So, the question from Janki Saran Badani, sir, what are those three legs, Dr. Agase, please? Is Agase, Dr. Agase here? He's not, but let me speak on his uh, behalf. I have uh, admitted him. He was mute. I have ah, admitted him. Okay. Vikas, sir? While well, Vikas is answering, is the, is the full screen on yeah. now? Yeah, okay. yeah, full, yeah, full screen is there. So, yeah, is Vikas, Vikas answering? No. His three okay. pillars are going to be the calcar, the lesser tuberosity, and the greater tuberosity, tuberosity. tuberosity. just for the yeah. delegates. Right. Okay, so so this is a, interestingly a patient who, uh, when I, I was out somewhere and this patient was put up for surgery for his tibia, okay? So he, he had a three month old injury, it was open fracture, which was initially treated with an external fixator and then that was removed at about uh, four weeks and then he was put into a cast. The wound had healed, but the fracture had not united at three months, so he came to us and he was actually put up for surgery and I saw him on the ward round uh, just before surgery and of course this is not what we'd be talking about in a shoulder this thing so he also had a injury to his le left shoulder when I asked him I was talking to him uh, before his surgery and apparently had a dislocation of his left shoulder for which he had a closed reduction was immobilized for three weeks and then mobilized but was having difficulty in lifting his arm and these were his shoulder x-rays at that time so anybody from the panel would like to comment on the x-ray? So firstly, John, that's not a true AP x-ray because that tends to be deceptive. So okay. my, uh, my recommendation is that please make every effort to get a true AP and an actual because this one is steep in internal rotation, rather deceptive. And uh, so it doesn't give this information. And when you're in doubt, just go repeat the x-ray. If not, then get a CT scan done if you think yeah. patient is not able to okay. position. But uh, if, you, if you look at this x-ray very carefully, what's this here? 
Can you see the arrow? And you see on the head, the lateral of the head is like something missing. Yeah, so this is an interesting say so easily missed if you look, just look yeah. up casually. And is that uh, a lesser tuberosity fragment? Uh, well, if I, no, lesser? No. Okay, so luckily he had his old x rays. This was his original injury. Okay, so they'd done a closed reduction. And this is what most of us would do, I guess. I would yeah. do a closed reduction. And that was the post, uh, post reduction x ray. And again, you can see, if you look very carefully, this is the fragment sitting here. Yeah. Okay, that's the graded tuberosity. And again, it's quite easy to miss. Yeah. I mean, uh, and so the uh, person treating him decided that this was okay and uh, there was no significant displacement for the tuberosity. And it's interesting how it looks. So obviously then he got the CT done and the, it was clear that this fragment sitting up here was the tuberosity fragment. And he was having difficulty. He couldn't move his arm mm. up. And so we did the tibia, but then we decided that something needs to be done. So anyone from the faculty would volunteer to tell us what we would do? How far back from the injury this is was three it? three months from the injury. So three months is very dodgy. I get more grief from greater tuberosity neglected then proximal humerus neglected, which you can conserve, as Pandeji has clearly said. And uh, it's iffy. I, there have been times when I've gone in three months and managed an anatomical fixation. And there yeah. have been times at three months that it just wouldn't budge. And the repercussions of a GT not being there is game over. It's all or none. Because then they cannot get any kind of forward flexion abduction at all. So it's very imperative. You do a lot of releases. Mm -hmm. My... Preference is arthroscopic because that's my DNA and uh, that's how I think. <laughs> because, but I mean, I get much better access medially so I can do a full-blooded release because that GT sits on the posterior superior glenoid. So I yeah. have to do a lot of release arthroscopically, use the radio frequency and then manage. My exception has been a one-year-old that I have managed. But I also have three other patients at three months that didn't come out completely and we had to medialize that fragment. Okay, so Pandey, anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, um, I think it's more like a cuff tear, isn't it? That, that tuberosity is broken, so it's taken the cuff with it. So you have to do something to bring the tuberosity somewhere close to where it was. Um, yeah. And, and, and yes, as Ashish said, you will require extensive release, and sometimes you may have to put the scope from inside and release inside and then come out and do a mini open, release it, pull it back. Uh, the important, the problem here is the original hole uh, gets filled up with fibrous tissue and scar tissue. So sometimes Absolutely. you cannot find the gap uh, or when you, once you've taken the scar tissue out, the gap is so big and the small fragment is so small. So it looks like a big mismatch, but I don't think we need to worry too much about the mismatch. Sometimes you can even make the tuberosity bone fragment slightly smaller if need be. But here I, I have failed to put screws. If it's okay. that far down, I will avoid screws and I will use anchors, two or three anchors, and try and uh, fix it like a rotator cuff there. Because the screws, as I said, there, there will be a big mismatch. And sometimes the screw is not properly attached distally, it starts to back out. Sure. So those are the few things. I would use anchors to fix this rather than screws. Okay, so anything more to add from either Tirachai or uh, Vikash? Or? I may, Just may try to try. use both. Sorry? Uh, I, I try to use the, you have to make a split deltoids. Mid deltoid yeah. split. This means slightly yeah. posterior. Yeah, so, yeah, so we are the open deltoid. surgeons, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do the open surgery. The coronal X-ray, the coronal yeah. X-ray is usually very deceptive because it looks medial, but it is in the nature of the GT to displace more yeah. posterior yeah. than medial. So okay. you really need to hunt posteriorly for this. Sure, I agree. So we went uh, the sort of uh, so that's where it's lying. If you look at the CT scan, and now you can see the defect here very clearly. Yeah, so where it's come from. Yeah, so we went open. Uh, trans deltoid and uh, we had to fish it out. Interestingly, it was quite mobile, this fragment. Okay, once we got it, we, had, we hooked it out from behind 
and then uh, with some release we could get it down and so what we did was we actually put a screw in it and also put in suture anchors and multiple sutures to repair also suture on the rotator cuff which was attached to the fragment but there was also a little bit of a separate fragment there which we sutured on with the thing and that was our post op x ray at the end of that okay now okay so that's what we were able to achieve this is him in one of the follow ups at about uh, this was uh, one month and then uh, luckily we got a longer follow up on, on him at 3 years 9 months and uh, some of these things held on and he ended up with a fairly good function not 100% normal but a fairly good function so i think some of these even late you can reconstruct but the good thing about this particular one was it was literally an evolution of the tuberosity with the rotator cuff so it didn't get plastered down everywhere although we did have to do some releases it wasn't very extensive release that we had to do to bring it back into place and the fragment was still reasonably in good shape to be able to put a screw and add on a, a, a suture anchor to support it i think john if i just uh, mention here if you look at this x ray your screw is here and the tuberosity is mostly held by the anchor no no but the tuberosity has a fragment going down there ah, okay and i put it down there yeah and the good thing is your screw is going right up to the calca so it got yeah. a better hold whereas yeah, the screw was short and there was no anchor this food may have been absolutely yeah. yeah okay so any questions otherwise we can go on to ashish yeah <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah one 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 question to dr john by yeah. the dr rishan sarraf has asked that how to reduce the gt and lt in a old case of four part fracture of proximal humerus okay so i think we'll talk about that in the uh, in my later talk Yeah, okay that yes yeah. it's difficult i mean the longer it is the more difficult it is and but we'll discuss it after that talk yeah yeah sure yeah ashish right have you got the full screen here yeah yeah yeah, yeah lovely so after those excellent uh, three talks uh, let's move to a little more complex schedule where we're going to talk about shoulder replacement uh, it's a shocking slide but it's true because the shoulder replacement as it is had a lot of bad press but most europeans are reluctant to do a hemi arthroplasty now for proximal humerus fractures and uh, there's a reason to that but the whole thing started about the reason hemi arthroplasty came in was there were a lot of reports of complications with lock plates and i think the lock plate has made everything look easy till the lock plate came in it looked like Uh, we didn't have a good implant, so most proximal humerus fractures were being conserved 20 years back, and then suddenly lock plate has given us a feature where we are empowered, and so they've been done left and right. Also, there is a confusion between fracture healing in an anatomical position and the restoration of function, and uh, there are two things that I would emphasize today: is you have to look into my talk. from a perspective that we are treating the elderly patient you cannot extrapolate these uh, findings that i am going to put forth to the younger patient number 2 my we are largely predicated on restoration of function and that is what we wish to send home the message now for a hemi arthroplasty to work you cannot use a monoblock stem and just put it in and expect it to work it is not like a austin moor prosthesis Uh, the shoulder is very complex and that's why it gets a lot of bad press because it's very difficult to replicate native shoulder anatomy to do that you need to think in a three dimensional manner and if you can achieve a three dimensional reconstruction and you can translate that into an ideal gt healing i'm not saying fixation an ideal gt healing you will achieve that if you position the height of the process is correctly and you achieve the perfect version and there's a lot i can talk about version as such even after doing that if the gt doesn't heal it will be game over and that's why many surgeons are reluctant the caveat here is that the results of primary hemi arthroplasty versus a fixation let me try fixation if it doesn't work i will offer a hemi arthroplasty is not a good policy because then 
you're dealing with a late fracture with a lot of soft tissue damage and those results cannot be as good as primary hemiopathy. So you need to take a decision on day one. And obviously there are many fractures in the gray zone where you are undecided whether this will work or that will work. And most of the times when I'm doing a hemi, I'm actually planning to do a fixation and I keep the hemi on my back table. I don't think it's fair to go on the table and say that I can't fix this, it's terrible, but I don't have a hemi. So I will put this into some kind of fixation. So you need to be prepared for both. The problem is the hemiarthroplasty done for osteoarthritis is remarkably different from doing a hemiarthroplasty in trauma. And the results are also equally different. The complication rates are much higher in trauma. Number one, because the proximal humerus is exploded, there is no landmark there to decide what is the version, what is the height of the prosthesis, uh, what rotation should I put that in. The biceps is unreliable. Often that is exploded, the groove of the biceps. Uh, you can use pec major as your height according to Murchowski's paper, but it's again a soft tissue, unreliable landmark. The version is crazy. You surgeons go wrong in humeral version in osteoarthritis, although they have GTLT in position. And in the trauma, you can imagine that uh, it just looks like a round cylinder looking at you. And you can, I've had to revise patients, they were put in 90 degrees, completely wrong side, and they just dislocated the second day. You need to recreate the posterior and lateral offset. You must ensure that the axillary nerve has not been involved. If there's an axillary neuropathy and you end up doing a reverse shoulder replacement, that could be a little sinister, and you have to be very cautious about that. You must be sure that the rotator cuff status of this given patient is appropriate in order to do a hemiarthroplasty for these patients. Unfortunately, most of these patients are fairly young. They're not like your arthritis patients. So patients like this who have a seemingly innocent fracture, looks three-part, looks fixable, and you go in, and it turns out to be osteoporosis because they are rheumatoid or they have comorbidities, and the whole eggshell is hollow, and those are where you get caught out. A conventional two- and three-part fracture can be fixed very nicely with a lock plate, and you can come out of that winning nine out of ten times. There's no question. But this is a nice paper from John Kontakis, and he said that in his patients, he'd had 11% GT complication, 7% proximal migration, because the GT did not heal in a hemiarthroplasty. And a hemiarthroplasty without a total shoulder will inevitably, inevitably lead to a medial erosion of the glenoid eventually and cause medialization. So this is important to understand. And the rehab program for hemiarthroplasty is quite challenging. This is Bruner's paper, European multi-center study. Uh, avascular is not a big deal with proximal humerus fractures, 8%, and most of them will revascularize very nicely because there's a very rich blood supply in the proximal humerus. But this paper across, across all of Europe has explained 25% reoperations, 45% complication rate, especially in the elderly. So we are dealing with elderly population and we are dealing with 70 and above. The quality of tissues, the quality of the bone are all compromised. And as a surgeon, I can't leverage that. So, and at the same time, we must understand that I think there was a very important point that was made by Dr. Agashe that you must leave your screws 10 mm short of the subchondral bone. This is not DHS. You can't put it subchondrally because screw penetration, unfortunately, has been the biggest malady of a lock plate fixation. And 22% is too high a rate, and it goes unrecognized because the lateral x-rays are not done. And these patients, unfortunately, come to me after a year or two years where the entire glenoid has been eroded, and it's unnecessary to subject these patients to a reverse shoulder replacement, even though the fractures heal adequately. A little bit about the axillary nerve. Do be very careful. I'm a great proponent of the delta pectoral approach uh, because even if there's a 1% risk of an axillary nerve going wrong, it's a disaster for that patient because it's all game over. If one does a lock plate, it goes wrong, it malunites, undergoes a non union I still have an option of revising that with bone graft. I can do a hemi or do many other options. If the axillary nerve is gone and these patients come to me like this gentleman, was operated at a premier institute, Haryana, and the deltoid split approach established axillary nerve palsy post-operatively. Prior, it was good. Long screws, 
the screws are proud. You can see they are uh, cut out completely. The damaging glenoid. He's had three surgeries before he came to me, and none of the surgeons handled the screws because these are plastic surgeons. They thought like a plastic surgeon. They continued working on the soft tissue and the axillary nerve, and poor fellow has come with complete arthritis now. So we had to go in, and with Anil Bhatia, we went in, explored the axillary nerve, we decompressed it completely, did a foam sack for him, and removed the implant unnecessarily. This is a very interesting paper, the one on the bottom, Westphal study. I would highly recommend you read that. And in their 40 patients, all of them deltoid split. They did EMGs for all those patients. They had a 10% incidence of axillary nerve damage. So do be very careful if you are not well versed with anatomy. If you don't have the experience of Kirachai, then be very careful. Just stick to your deltopectoral approach because you don't want to flirt with the axial nerve. Is the most important uh, part of that anatomy. Now, this was the paper that spoiled everything for hemiarthroplasty. Pascal Boiler study, 2000, and Pascal is one of the senior most surgeons, extensive shoulder experience, and 23% of his patients had a detachment of the greater tuberosity. Even after an initial correct positioning, so even if you do this code on the day one, and it displaces later on, especially in females above 75. So do be careful about this. And that's why, unfortunately, in France and Germany, they just stopped doing hemiarthroplasty. They would directly do a reverse shoulder for these patients. So these are three different scenarios of all my patients. You look at number one scenario, of course, this is the complicated neglected dislocation. We were compelled to put the stem down because they, all the tissues were too tight. There was a paper thin subscap. Number two, I had positioned the GT perfectly well. This was a senior 65-year-old Parkinson's patient. And six weeks later, prior to starting rehab, the GT just underwent osteolysis because the GT derives its blood supply from the marrow. If the GT does not integrate and heal, it is just going to undergo osteolysis and disappear. Number three is the ideal scenario. When you put your GT in there, it should look that it belongs there. And that's very important to understand that looks like it belongs there means that it should be like a watertight closure. Number two, the peak of the head of humerus and the GT should have an 8 mm difference between them. And at the same time, you must ensure that it's sutured. We cannot use screws and wires in there. I use number five ethibond to fix these patients. That's very important. Now, version, there's a lot of chaos about version. We are conventionally told to put in 30 degrees version. I completely uh, am against that. We published uh, this paper in the Journal of uh, International Journal of Anatomy. And amongst the 65 cadavers we did, the largest variation on all the morphological sizes were on versions. And they were varied from 18 degrees to 55 degrees. Most of the available instrumentation allows you to choose 20, 30, and 40. That's it. So you need to be on the top of it. If you do a wrong version, as you see in this diagram here, you will notice that even if he rotates it gently, that GT is going to come off completely. So that is very important that you understand what is a version and you would need to be familiar with anatomy. There are a number of jigs available for the shoulder replacement sets. They're very complicated, tedious, and uh, difficult to use, especially in small incisions, which I do. So instead, I prefer to use a trauma stem. So if you're doing a hemiarthroplasty or osteoarthritis, you can use a conventional polish stem, it's fine. But when you're doing trauma, because there's explosion, because you want the GT and LTs to sit in, you must have a trauma stem. By trauma stem, I mean that this is a conventional reamer, whereas this is the reamer from a trauma stem because it has these nice four markings. We helped develop this design with Evolutis and I was instrumental in designing this design. And these are the same designs that are replicated here on the final stem. The final stem is smooth distally, but proximal two thirds is hydroxyapatite coated and it has a honeycomb shape here. So it creates a friction fit between the tuberosities. So it allows the tuberosities and keeps them there. That is very important. The screw holes, the thread holes for the sutures are not exciting. I rarely use through the stem, I prefer to pass the sutures through the bone because I want the GT and LT to heal with bone. But this one is important and that's called as a recess hole for the circular suture. I'll come to explaining that in a later few slides here. Once you're done and you're finished, you must repair GT to LT, L, uh, sorry, GT to shaft, LT to shaft and the GT to LT as well. 
along with that. So it has to be a robust fixation. We call this the parachute closure so that you have a watertight closure, which means that you've balanced the shoulder correctly. The soft tissue balance is adequate. Your sizing has been perfect. You've not overstuffed it and your soft tissue repair is good. So that patient is like you do it. We lost about three greater tuberosities. I have problems with two other patients. Uh, and since then we've improvised the technique. I'm going to share the pulse. The two things that we did to change our practice was number one, this was the Mark Frankel near award paper. We started using two circlage sutures, number five or some of the fancy uh, fiber wires uh, to wrap around in an orthogonal plane and in this fashion. And we use the knee snot. So we published a study on the knee snot and we've proven that the knee snot is much stronger than a simple surgical knot. And since then, touch wood, uh, knocking on wood heavily here, we've not lost a single tuberosity. But that means that there are almost 12 sutures in there. You have to be a master of suture management at the same time. The one other thing we did with the company was we demanded metal spacers. Often they'll give you these plastic spacers and when you put them in, it doesn't give you the configuration. You don't know whether GT, or GT and LT are sitting in their ideal position, but when you use metal spacers because you need at least four or five different sizes, then I know that once I have fixed my GT in there, that GT with reference to the top edge of the humeral head gives me an accurate establishment. This is an offset same. This lateral view is very critical. And I can see that the anterior offset is marginal. The posterior offset is significant and it is covering the head ideally, which means that I think I have balanced this shoulder appropriately and chosen the correct sizes. A little diversion here. Sometimes you have a 60 year old lady and you're reluctant to a hemiarthroplasty because the literature is stacked against you and it looks like a hollow head, split head and uh, so we go in and we do this intramedullary device. So this is in between, between a fixation and a hemiarthroplasty. This is just unique. Uh, it's a simpler technique. It takes 40 minutes to do it, but you must apply it in an appropriate fashion. It's done through the deltoid split approach. And since it's intramedullary, it maintains, prevents the virus. And there's separate head fragment, which is a staple, there's separate shaft stem. And then you made the two, and then you can actually bring about reduction by a ratcheting mechanism. Equally important, whether you do a lock plate, hemiarthroplasty, just unique or reverse shoulder, you must repair the greater tuberosity back into position because again, I would re reiterate, it's the greater tuberosity healing that wins matches, not the repair. This is the lady and you can see this. This is two years uh, after surgery and she has done exceedingly well. Not only is she able to do anything, she's an actual yoga teacher and it was very important for her and she made a request that try not to do a replacement because it will stop my yoga classes because that's her breadwinner. So it can be well. This is a process that can be revised in case goes wrong and you can still retain the stem. But hopefully if you planned it well, you must not need to revise this processes. This was our paper about the our results of hemiarthroplasty in the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, 2011, uh, we had about 56 patients. This was a younger group, uh, proximal humerus fractures, uh, three-part and four-part, and we had a decent uh, result, average 111, average port flexion was 143, and uh, we did not have any difference between three-part, four-part, or splitted fractures. Average UCLAs were 28, uh, and uh, there was no significant difference outcome between the fracture types as such. Now, you must understand there's a third option here, which is a reverse shoulder replacement maintained only for the very senior elderly 70 plus patients. But it's important to understand what are the differences between hemi and reverse. The reverse is uh, exceedingly better in osteoporotic patients who do not have a greater tuberosity or who do not have a rotator cuff, in which case their function will work even if the cuff is absent. So their flexions are better, the abductions are better, the rotations need not be better. If a hemi goes well and everything heals up, your rotations are much better on hemi arthroplasty. But the reverse shoulder is a fail safe. Even the tuberosity doesn't integrate, your patient is still going to do well. You know, dealing with 75 and 80 years old, you just want to do one operation and you don't want them to come back for a resurgery. Yeah. Uh, rehab is easier. You're dealing with very elderly patients. You don't need a classy rehab program like a hemi arthroplasty where it has to be spot on. Of course, the costs are higher, the complication rates are much higher, 
so you need to be really on the ball to be able to handle a reverse shoulder at this time so in short a uh, hemi is tuberosity dependent the reverse is tuberosity independent uh, the hemi by itself without a glenoid resurfacing is likely to cause medial erosion in my practice it takes about 10 11 years to, to do that uh, the reverse is surface on both surfaces so it's not a problem uh, 10 year results well, after 10 years because of the aging and the rotator cuff dysfunction results for both hemi and reverse are supposed to drop down according to the shuklas paper in journal of shoulder elbow surgery this one is hot of the press this is barlow this is from york in sanchez sotelo's uh, mayo hospital very high end tertiary referral center and this was very recently published in journal shoulder elbow surgery last year average age more than 60 they had about 176 patients 44% complications requiring re surgery 34% sorry 34% requiring re surgery and those who are above 80 had a 50% failure rate the reason for that is the tissue and the nature of the bone and the absence of rotator cuff in these patients and that's why you want to do only one operation so you you can choose on doing only a conservative operation or then if it's a three and four part dysfunctional fracture i would rather go in for a reverse in this patient this is a gentleman who's a multi comminuted many fragments split head came to us six weeks from indoor uh, after the injury because nobody was operating him Uh, was a politician and we had to do a hemi arthroplasty sometimes when i'm doing a hemi arthroplasty in trauma i would cement this this is a older generation uh, stem uh, but conventionally although i would choose uncemented but in trauma it is very important that you stem cement the distal part now coming to this lady 81 year old lady three parts she's an active lady drives her own two wheeler she works at her sons uh, factory manages all his accounts very alert very intelligent and she had this three part she's 80 the temptation was to leave her alone not do anything but uh, it was important to give her function she was so intelligent she questioned me for about 15 minutes and tell told me what is the guarantee that i would do well i have to have my function she lives alone so we counseled her and offered her a reverse shoulder replacement given her osteoporosis and a three part fracture this is a uncemented uh, reverse shoulder replacement we've done we've managed to restore her radials we have got a three year follow up on her and if you can look at her uh, range of movement this is what i'm trying to incline it's perfectly okay for somebody to treat that fracture without surgery or do something minimally invasive but as i said we are heavily leveraged on the restoration of function and when you can see she is so much with it and she is a regular follow up in fact she is due april every year and we managed to restore almost 80% of function and that's the uh, nature of the reverse shoulder which is very forgiving if it's done correctly and the tuberosity is integrate you actually get back your significant amount of rotations and uh, but of course you have to be very sure that uh, the complication rates are not higher uh because it's a slightly more complex surgery it deals with uh very frail elderly patients and often they have comorbidities but the whole idea is not to subject them to revision surgery and to restore their radials you can't fault us on that for having done a reverse shoulder on this patient so finally in conclusion the you must remember now i have put forth that there are several options i have eliminated nail i'm not too fancy Uh, fancy it about the nails do i have used them seldom you have a plate you have a just unique intermedial device you have a hemi arthroplasty and you have a reverse shoulder and often there are gray cases where in the gray zone you're not sure whether you need one or two you could use either of them provided you are sure you are restoring the function and not creating more complications for a second surgery but often we tend to forget and i completely endorse uh, pandeji's talk here that there is another beautiful option by beautiful i mean the sling don't get uh, distracted here but it's often an option when you do this and we do a lot of patients who are conserved but do be careful mobilize them early as pandeji said but do serial x rays on the conserved patients every week so finally in conclusion i would like to say that number one be careful that you understand the nature of the disease it's a very complicated fracture the point is you could do a very good job on an x ray but you may not restore 
function. So you must separate the wood from the trees and not show x-rays, but give the patients their function. And each patient is different. You can't use the same hammer to treat every nail. So along with that, you must also understand that whatever you do, whether you are GT fixation or you do a plating or a hemiarthroplasty, the greater tuberosity is got to heal in its native position. Mm -hmm. Younger patients, uh, you have to be careful if you're doing a hemiarthroplasty. Uh, when you're using a hemiarthroplasty, definitely use a trauma prosthesis, but understand the native version and morphology of the shoulder. Uh, results, reverse shoulder replacements are better than reverse shoulder. Uh, the reverse shoulder for elective cases, non-trauma are far superior than reserve, reverse, reserve, reverse yeah. shoulders for proximal humerus fractures. So you must be careful. You don't treat them as if I'm going to get them back their full movement as such, but reserve them for the very elderly, frail, fractured dislocation patients as such. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, sir. Okay, so do we have um, uh, time to continue, Rajiv? Yes, sir. We can continue. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, we have time. Yeah, there is one question from the uh, viewer to Ashish that uh, uh, like in an impression fracture of uh, head of the humerus, what is the indication of primary uh, arthroplasty? See, there are a lot of other factors, Rajiv, that you need to consider is what is the incidence of impression fracture? If there is that impression fracture associated with the posterior anterior dislocation, uh, if it is within 5 mm, the unsatisfactory position, I would feel free to conserve him. And if it is significant, and if it's in a very young person, then I'm very reluctant to replace them. So there is another technique for these patients where you can go distally into the humerus, where you usually put your calcar screw and just make a drill hole like you do for an AVN and impact the bone out and the impression fracture can be pushed out. So then you're getting the cartilage, you're not voiding the joint, you've not opened the joint. And then, of course, you'll have to bone graft the track in there. So that's the via media for the younger patients. Uh, most impression fractures that are less than one third of the size of the head, I would feel free to leave them alone, conserve them. And if they were to go bad, I can always replace them at a later stage without compromising the result. Yes. Thank you. So there is one uh, uh, case from audience to show for opinion. Can you share that case, sir? We'll do it at the end, OK? Yes, Can we do that at the end, if that's okay? Yes, sir. Fine, sir. No problem, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so. Yes, sir. So I, I invite Dr. John Mukoka there, and uh, he'll be talking on uh, uh, salvage in non-unions, please, sir. Okay, so I need to share. Okay. Yeah, first open this file and then share it. Yeah. Is that good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is coming. Full is, uh, no, I think. Now yeah, sure. right. Yeah, right. Okay. right. Sir. Okay. okay, so I'll be brief because uh, we are kind of stretching our time a little bit. So I think uh, we can uh, get these patients at various stages with problems following proximal humerus fractures, uh, either early during the course of treatment because of some complication or late with non unions malunions, implant failures, or infection. Uh, so you can get some unexpected complications sometimes. And this is a, a gentleman in his 40s who had this fracture dislocation. And I think most of us would do a close reduction and then look at the tuberosity and decide whether we need to do any operative fixation or not. And uh, this was what was done somewhere. But what happened was during the course of the reduction, I don't you remember, I don't have in the records whether this was done under anesthesia or without, but this is what it ended up with. And the head remained there while the uh, shaft came back to the tuberosity. So it became a, now a fracture dislocation with uh, a neck fracture as well. So from a two-part fracture dislocation, it became a three-part fracture dislocation. And about 10 days after that, he presented to us. And uh, so we did... And this was before the era of lock plates, so we did it through a deltopectoral approach. We actually did a 
osteotomy of the coracoid to make this retraction of the conjoint tendon easier. And we used a conventional plate, the plate which we used to in those days and fixed it. And this was the post-op position of the x-rays. And uh, we kind of lost him to follow up until he came back four years later with another patient. And luckily he had done quite well. If you look very carefully at the x-rays, maybe there's some signs of some avian with some backing out of the screws. But because they were conventional screws, they backed out rather than go through the joint and he ended up with a fairly good function with healing of his fracture. Here's another case where uh, the technical problems with fixation with the lock plates you have to be aware of. This was a proximal humerus fracture and this is how it was fixed. And uh, if you see the position of the plate, the reduction, they're all faulty. And he came to us 25 days down the line. And one of the good things, luckily, as a result of this was that uh, if you looked at the head, there were hardly any screws that actually went into the head. So uh, this is one of the issues with the lock plates because the screws locked on, lock on to the plate. You may not get the biofeedback that you would get normally. Uh, and so you don't know what the screw is holding on to. Anyway, so we had to go in, get the fragments reduced, put the sutures on the tuberosities as we are supposed to. And then we went ahead and fixed it with this lock plate. And luckily, this is the last follow-up he had was at two months. He was doing well with it, with the fracture going on to heal with him regaining function as well. So these are the kind of early problems we sometimes get uh, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, fixations. Either they haven't been done properly or there's a delay in diagnosis, etc. Uh, what we get later on are the non-unions or the malunions. Uh, non-unions, as has been discussed, are not common, but when they do uh, develop a frank non-union, there is significant disability. Uh, they, they can have pain, they have weakness with a flail limb, and surgical treatment can be challenging. And it's interesting in this uh, paper by Court Brown, uh, with, I think, more than a 1,000 cases, they actually said that the prevalent of non-union was as low as 1.1%. But if there was metaphysical comminution, it went up to 8%. And if there was more than 33% translation, it, it went as high as 10%. And they also said that there was a deterioration in the glenohumeral function if these fractures failed to unite. Now, what are the problems that you have to deal with in the non-unions? Okay. There's the non-union that you have to deal with. Uh, the shoulder joint in itself would be stiff. With, uh, there's fibrosis of the soft tissue. There'll be instability at the fracture. The fragments may be malpositioned. You have loss of bone stock. And sometimes these head fragments, if they are uh, lying uh, without function for a long time, really become very osteoporotic. Uh, is there a room for conservative treatment? Of course, if the symptoms are minimal, you can do it. But otherwise, you need to think of some form of fixation. And today, I think the lock plates really form the mainstay of fixation. Uh, arthroplasty would be considered where reconstruction is not considered possible. And that has been discussed. So this is one of the earlier cases we treated with the lock plate, a 60-year-old lady who presented with an eight-month-old non-union. And she had real trouble lifting up. So you can see, even at eight months, there's a frank non-union here. Uh, we, of course, the CT confirmed it. You can see a clear non-union here with sclerosis of the ends and obviously an osteoporotic head. So here we used uh, uh, iliac crest corticocancellous bone graft fragment. So you can see the bone graft, which was put in there on the medial side. Some of the screws going through the bone graft. This is a post-op X-ray and at 16 months follow-up, she recovered reasonably good function, not full internal rotation, as you can see, and not full abduction, but a reasonably good function, considering for eight months she was unable to use the arm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these, uh, this lady who came six years after injury, you can see how osteoporotic the proximal fragment is. I mean, there's hardly any bone there. Uh, this, I mean, I don't think we really needed a CT, but it was done. And you can see the head is really doesn't have any bone here. And here's where I think the intramedullary fibula comes in handy. You need to put it into the humerus and into the 
head as well, get the alignment right. Here's some extra corticocancellous bone graft and the fixation. And this is her at four months. You can see how nicely she's gone on to heal. And because a lot of these screws are actually going through the fibula here, it gives you a very good purchase. Some of these screws are going through it. So even on the shaft, you get an excellent purchase. And she got back a fairly good range of motion and function. Uh, some of the literature on non-unions, if you looked at the early literature in the 90s, uh, the results were fairly poor with, with only 48% getting good results in this paper. And uh, in this uh, 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 paper by Ring et al. here using a sort of blade plate, slightly better results with 20 of 25 patients getting good to excellent results. Uh, with the lock plate and the use of the intramedullary strut allograft, Badman et al. got much better results, close to 94% radiographic union. And so I think the lock plates and where necessary a fibular graft, we don't use them routinely, but in some cases where the bone is very osteoporotic or you expect a lot of stress on the implant, the intramedullary fibula certainly plays a part. Uh, interesting, this paper by Dr. Maheshwari, again, using lock plates, but here he did not do anything to the area of the non-union. He just put a medial strut graft and fixed it with the screws across as a support for the head. And he showed very good results with this. And I think six out of seven or eight cases, which healed up. And this interesting paper from the Resch group, where we, used, we talked about the Resch device. This is what it looks like. It's got these threaded wires. Uh, this block and this tension band wiring. And they showed good results, even with non-unions using this technique, uh, with, where you had a very small fragment of the head using this rich technique, they were able to get good results. What about failed fixations? Okay, I think this becomes even more complicated because on top of the other problems, you have the problem of implant removal, especially if it's been a lock plate that's been used. You have even more fibrosis you may have infection and you may have even further bone loss. So this is a gentleman, young gentleman who presented to us long time ago. I think this was before the philos when we had the proximal humerus lock plates. He had had two previous surgeries and this is what he presented to us with at about 17 months after his original injury. Again, you can see the scalloping of the bone here with the gap here and obviously lysis because of the mobility at the fracture site. And here we used a cortical, cortical cancellous strut graft to fill the cavity, as well as uh, the lock plate fixation. That's where the strut graft was. And this is him at six months. You've seen he's gone on to heal. Uh, this gentleman was from Afghanistan and he hasn't come back after this, but he had some relatives in Patna who asked him to come here and see me. Another gentleman, 50 year old. Again, if we looked at some of the uh, cases shown by Dr. Pandey may be a case where conservative treatment might have helped, but this is what was done. And now you can see the tuberosity has gone even further up. Uh, this is the kind of position that he came to us with. And uh, this was about nine months down the line, one year down the fi fixation, that's what he came to us with. And obviously things were going on to fail. And here we had to go and do so we tried to get the tuberosity down as well and fix it with these threaded wires apart from the lock plate. And at seven months, he had gone on to heal his fracture with a fairly good functional result. Uh, this lady who came to us uh, six years after her original injury now, she had surgery one year for a non-union. This was the plate that was used and this uh, sort of failed fairly soon. I think within about four or five months of the fixation, and then the proximal fragment was lying in this abducted position while the distal fragment was lying uh, sort of vertically down. And this was a big issue because you'd have to think of uh, not only the non-union, the poor bone stock, the previous implant, uh, the fibrous tissue in the fracture site, but also of the position of the proximal fragment. So we, you really need to release adequately to get this fragment to a reasonable position where you would expect your implant to hold. So here was another situation where we had to really release the subacromial space all the way around uh, the rotator cuff area, all the way around to get a good release of the proximal fragment to be able to bring it down 
but we also use the intramedullary strut fibula with screws going through the fibula to augment our fixation. And this is how she was at eight months post-op. So even in these really late non-unions where they've been without function for many years, if you can get the anatomy restored, you can get the fracture healed adequately, they should get, get back fairly good range of motion and function. So it is worth trying to do in these cases. Uh, what about malunions? I think uh, there's, uh, there are various types. Again, the tuberosities can be very difficult to deal with, but the neck malunions, which I embarrass or different positions, you can do an osteotomy and get it back to get good function. So here was a relatively young gentleman, and here we did an anterolateral wedge here to get it reduced. And this was again with the proximal humerus locking plate before the philos plate was available. But you can see how we've been able to restore the position. And he, this is him at two years post, four months post op, uh, back to a good function and a good result. So I think this was a case where they did this valgus wedge osteotomy, a paper where they did this valgus osteotomy with fairly good results. Three had excellent results and two were good results. Uh, what about infection? I think this is a problem that is even harder to deal with. Uh, this was a patient who within three months came with this discharging wound and the plate implants that had completely gone off. So here we had to do a thorough debridement. Uh, we uh, uh, decided to use an external fixator, but we used uh, hydroxy appetite coated pins and we docked the fracture nicely in this position. We used antibiotic beads, got the infection under control. Uh, he went back and he came back only six months later. And by that time, uh, the fracture seemed to be going on to heal. The initial plan was to convert to internal fixation once we got the infection controlled. But he came back six months later. And by then, although there was some collapse into virus, the fracture had healed. So we just took out the external fixator and uh, you can see now the fracture has gone on to heal quite well. Uh, missed posterior dislocations, that's another problem where, uh, where if the initial diagnosis is missed, and this patient came to us more than six months, close to seven months after injury. And if you see the lateral, you can see the dislocation there. CT shows you the sort of big gap in the bone with the uh, area of the lesser tuberosity. And here, uh, to approach this, you often have to do this osteotomy here, and the idea is to osteotomize this and then use that to fill the defect in the head. So uh, difficult to do at six months, but you go through the rotator interval, get to the back, release the tissue, and then get the head back in uh, with uh, uh, using the McLaughlin procedures, uh, modified McLaughlin procedure. Uh, we actually used, uh, I don't, I've missed out that x-ray, we actually used a K-wire initially to hold the head in position. Uh, this was him at three months post-op, and this is 13 months post-op and two-year follow-up. You can see, although there's some uh, signs of AVN, you can see his, uh, the head is healed and reasonably well with a fairly good function. So even these, and the posterior dislocation, some of the late cases are really worth doing because the results uh, are quite gratifying. And even if the x-rays don't always look great, uh, they get back a fairly good functional result. So to uh, conclude, I'd say that neglected fractures of the proximal humerus are a challenging problem. I think non-unions usually cause significant disability. There are some patients with fibrous non-unions who function reasonably well. But we've had some of these then uh, sort of having a minor trauma, then sort of uh, shifting this fibrous non-union and then having trouble. I think successful treatment of these non-unions are possible with proper techniques. And I think you should reserve arthroplasty for the elderly with very high non-unions where reconstruction may not be possible. Otherwise, I think a lot of these, it's still possible to get salvage the joint and uh, get back reasonable function with uh, proper techniques of fixation and uh, bone grafting where necessary. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, any questions? We can take that, and then we can go on to the whatever. Uh, there are the, there's a couple of questions uh, to Dr. Pandey that one of the viewer has asked. Uh, once, uh, let me tell you that uh, at present the viewers are 2,000. 
with yeah. us. And yeah. uh, one of the viewer has asked that if the head fragment is without a metaphysis, a metaphysial spike is considered to be avascular and should not be treated conservatively. It is, is it right or wrong, sir? Well, Dr. whenever, <laughs> whenever <laughs> such blanket statements are made in orthopedics, they are generally wrong. It is yeah. somebody's personal opinion. I think it's not yeah. just one thing which decides whether the... By doing an operation, how are you improving the blood supply? That is true. Yeah, so you need to be very sure that where, by doing the operation, all you're doing is you're improving the x-ray and maybe mobilizing the patient <clears throat> slightly earlier. So it's not just medial spike or lateral spike or the tuberosity is broken. It's a, you have to assess the whole fracture and you have to remember that there is a patient attached to this fracture. So what is, what is his requirement? If he's an 80-year-old or a 75-year-old or a 40-year-old, the treatment will be different as to what the patient wants. So I would say, are you going to improve the blood supply with surgery? No. If you're not going to do that, then the treat the fracture as you would treat yeah, the, the fracture uh, in a particular patient. And one more question to you that is there be any role of abduction splint in shoulder in doing the conservative management? So Vikash, maybe you can put on your screen uh, yeah. while yeah. your case and then sure. we'll have Ashish's at the end. Eh? Uh, no, in my practice, there is no role for abduction splints for conservative management of proximal fibrillus. It's a very, very uncomfortable splint comfortable. to wear. Yeah. You yeah. know, imagine if your arm is like that, you can't get through the door. You, I mean, maybe you can social distance better, but uh, <laughs> you, you, it is an, it, it, most, most people yeah. uh, wear it in the hospital. When they go home, they take it off. And then they, when they come back for follow-up in the hospital, they put it back on. That is my feeling. So I would avoid <laughs> any sort of special abduction. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So we'll we'll go to the case discussion. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Vikas Agassi, yeah. please. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Full screen. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Full screen. So I call this case as a floating shoulder plus. Uh, <laughs> So this 63-year-old uh, man presented four days after a vehicular accident. You can see the significant abrasions, soft tissue damage, uh, penetrating injuries here with clavicle, comminuted, capillary injury, glenoid injury, and uh, the humerus in several pieces. non-hypertensive. He, he had multiple glass pieces uh, that were taken out. See, he was traveling in a car and the car was hit and he had a direct injury there and uh, multiple glass pieces had gone inside. They were removed on day one uh, immediately after the, uh, after the accident. And two days later, he started developing perillum discharge, which was collected. And when he came to our place, he was carrying a report that uh, that pus had uh, grown staph and pseudomonas. And this is where we are. His finger and hand movements and sensations were normal. Elbow movements up below the elbow sensations were okay. Uh, it was very, very difficult to examine his elbow movements. Uh, distal pulsations and circulation was okay. To add to the problems, he had multiple fracture ribs and some hemonemothorax. That's his CT. Uh, part of the glenoid distally was intact, but proximally the glenoid was fractured in several pieces. That's the head partly. That is the head which is turned away and several pieces here. Multi extensive scapular injury. That's a glenoid seen from this side. That's the CT. So question is, obviously debridement one has to do. When would you fix? How would you fix? Or would you conserve? 
uh, and finally the the relatives would ask what is going to be the outcome can infection come under control and most important can he do his activities of daily living and can he do a little more like driving a car do overhead activities etc so i throw this open to the panelist uh, dr pandey what would you think oh you chose me what have i done to you <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the question I, i ask that is the question i ask the patient also <laughs> yeah so i think the initial management of this patient is not that difficult i mean the fracture will come a bit later on so the initial management has to be things like um, make sure his chest injuries are all sorted uh, there's no rush to do anything to the fracture infection is absolutely vital here i mean that has to be controlled a good skin cover has to be there till that is achieved i won't worry too much about the fracture right now my main worry will be his life if that is okay then make sure his neurovascular state is okay but infection is crucial we need to make sure that the uh, infection gets sorted now as to whether he will have what kind of result we know he will have he will definitely not have a normal shoulder i mean he will definitely not have even 80% of what he could do today whether he will drive a car and overhead activities my opinion i don't think he'll be doing a lot of overhead activities now whether he drives a car or not only time will tell but i will paint a slightly poorer prognosis to him and his relatives considering what we see uh, and i have to sort of tell him that initially we should try to save your limb correct Uh, and then we will talk about other things yeah life limb and then other things yeah. yes yeah. yes but okay so uh, providing okay he's had his chest tube and he's stabilized and right. Right. Uh, to deal with the infection uh, apart from debridement don't you think stability of the fracture is important yes um hmm i mean that's that's yeah. a very good uh, point you make uh, john but in 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 if it's a long bone fracture absolutely uh, but in a shoulder injury where there is a lot of soft tissue there uh, yes if there is a neurovascular compromise then um, maybe you want to go and fix the clavicle only but i would not do that by conventional techniques maybe you can put external fixator on the clavicle just to stabilize it but um i'm i'm very reluctant to put anything there at the moment if i can uh somehow uh try and get over the infection without putting metal work in there so you okay. will get plastic surgeons involved and get a, get a thorough debridement done and make sure you get some sort of healing even if you get some sort of healing in a couple of weeks time then i would think about doing something for the clavicle uh and see what happens yeah i any, uh, any thoughts uh, dr tirchai yeah it's so complicated so i i agree you have to get it up infection first and yeah wait until good wound condition and you fix the the head split and the, the clavicle i think it it should be look at the patients and see what uh, is the progression yeah so yeah so i, I mean i uh, would agree but i i found we've done a few cases like this and we tend to really go in and debride and then uh, the problem is an x fix is not a realistic option here and uh, today with the lock plates we sometimes will go ahead and fix the fracture as well and get a good flap cover as soon as possible uh, and use that as part of your infection control itself because it's early yet it's only 2 days i don't think uh, the biofilms etc would have formed so if you really do a radical debridement maybe this would be the best time to fix the fracture as well and uh, ashish any inputs 
no i agree the infection for two days old patient is not a big deal yeah, yeah. your best chances to go in now yes uh, you yes. said he was 60 years old right 63 yes yeah so yes. i would stabilize the clavicle rather than do something open and big i would do an intramedullary clavicle fixation there and then on this side i would debride thoroughly and uh, use either a, a plate to get this uh, humerus in position and i might defer the glenoid uh, yeah. depending on yeah, what would. time i spend during surgery but he would need a glenoid fixation uh, if everything is open and i'm right there then i might as well fix that as well because it looks like a superior inferior uh, type fracture so that if that's a type 3 then i can just put a superior to inferior screw and uh, that works well to the neviser portal uh, the the glenoid appeared quite comminuted i i just show the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's extending posteriorly so it would be a bit posteriorly yeah. yeah yeah so i think probably anyway let's see what you did because we are yeah yeah, um, time, yeah. obviously uh, i said we'll have to wait for a couple of, uh, for a day at least so uh, the plastic surgeon my colleague vivek shetty and myself we just just sat together and planned and uh, we felt that uh, a we need to excise that skin there is no doubt about that exactly that so, so that right. skin we plan to excise then we plan to take a delto pick we we felt that unless we stabilize the humerus and the clavicle exactly. clavicle mm -hmm. first because otherwise the entire brachial plexus may be pulled down so we thought we'll fix the clavicle and um, open this after excising the uh, uh, skin and fix the humerus yeah so clavicle and humerus we decided to fix on the same day uh, because we thought that otherwise as john said that we will not have good stability to fight the infection so that was the plan so this was delto pectoral so we did interfract screw fixation and uh, fixation of the clavicle that's the head you can see that's a part of lesser tuberosity with head that's uh, other part of the head and uh, that's the fixation we achieved the lesser tuberosity is fixed to the head and the if you notice this is the first version of humerus locking plate phlp phlp yeah. humerus locking plate this was before the philos came in there was a year or so where uh, phlps were available so uh, that is what we got and um, that's we had to explore the wound twice because the the deltoid just kept on getting uh, so necrotic so i had to be very very aggressive in taking out all the necrotic tissue this is the uh, ct just to reconfirm and wanted to check the oh sorry uh, check the glenoid and the glenoid was markedly comminuted so we really decided not to do anything for the glenoid and this is him uh, we did an emg which showed c5 root avulsion and yeah. that is him at about 3 months that's at 3 months he had started doing uh, no pain of course he had good no active abduction but other movements were reasonably good and he was doing almost all activities of daily living this is at 16 months heel fracture very comfortable can lift in up to here obviously no abduction at all uh, he has some uh, scapulothoracic movements but the hand can lift about 5 kilos he can't obviously do over air activities he travels by air but he says he asks someone else to uh, put the uh, luggage into overhead compartment but apart from that he is almost able to do everything so right. this is where we are yeah. yeah i think so that's a good uh, example of where sometimes you need to fix even where situations are not ideal because stability is part of your fight against infection right. uh, i think uh, are, i think it didn't seem to need a flap yeah no uh, we did a split thickness graph huh. he we did, he didn't need a flap that's his incision that is what we had excised and with because of the humerus i think there was decent uh, cover we could get decent soft tissues and then we did a thickness graph okay so i think uh, we uh, ashish one case and then we should call it a day is that okay sure
Sure, just sure. take one of the two, whichever one you prefer. And yeah. Because we are Makes sense. close to yeah. Yeah. 3 o'clock. Yeah? People would be dying so to get lunch. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. So instead of, uh, you know, asking questions how to go about it, yes, I'll just run yeah. through how what it handled it. Oh, I would sure. have loved to grill the panel. It was a unique opportunity. <laughs> but I guess we'll have we're to have that. We're happy you don't have to do <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. This is... <laughs> 58-year-old gentleman uh, came from Konkan, uh, which is about 400 kilometers from here, and he had a comminuted uh, fracture proximity, bad one, documented axial nerve law damage, 80% sensory loss, and uh, these were his CT scans, uh, split head as well, a lot of fragments, and that was his 3D. So I think the 3D makes much more sense than a 2D, so it's important to ask for 3D reconstructions. Quite clearly, 58, I was inclined to do a hemiarthroplasty, but that dilemma of the presence of axillary nerve is always a compromise. Now, looking through literature, it was that almost 80% of axillary nerve injuries will recover. In the presence of axillary nerve injury and a nasty fracture, it was important to stabilize the fracture to give the nerve a chance to heal. Otherwise, the whole construct of the fracture will pull and continue pulling the axillary nerve down. So we had to read the riot act, take his um, consent, and we explained very clearly that if the axial nerve doesn't work, this is going to fail, and you might need a complex revision. But we are expecting 70 to 80% chance for it to fail. Were it not to recover, we would consider another surgery as such. And so we went in and did a decent job. We put everything together. You can see it's very unusual for me to use cement, but because it was a complicated fracture, we put in there. We got a couple of wires across and got the tuberosities in their position as well. And everything went quite well. We actually managed to get the tuberosity healed. This is the trauma stem. It has a hydroxyapatite port and everything heals nicely. You can see by virtue of the axillary nerve injury, the whole construct is inferiorly subluxed. This was uh, six weeks after surgery, that x-ray. And then at four months, he came and he said the sensations have improved. From 80% loss, they've come down to 40%, but motor-wise, it was doing nothing. So his Supra was grade 4, Infra and Hornblower was grade 3. We were unable to give him a rehab because there's no motor drive there at all. So we repeated his EMG and we found no healing potential at all. There were still denervation changes, no signs of renervation. Uh, so polyphasic uh, signals were still persistent. So we decided that we go in and explore and we said that if the axilla nerve is significantly damaged, contused, and we would stimulate the axilla nerve, if it were not to work, then we would actually go ahead and do a SOMSAC procedure. So SOMSAC procedure is uh, where we would uh, use the uh, radial nerve to the medial head of triceps and transfer it to the axilla nerve. It works much better than a graft because you get a ready-made supply to feed the ax axilla nerve. And having gone in there, we actually found that the axial nerve was okay, contused. There's a lot of scar tissue around the axial nerve. So we just did a decompression of the axial nerve. Uh, we usually use a very light uh, muscle relaxant so that we can stimulate the nerve. And after releasing the psychiatrics, we realized that the nerve was firing better. We could actually elicit deltoid contractions, uh, all three bellies. And so we just did a thorough decompression. Okay, but this, this is one of the three cases that we have done where we've actually had to go in and repair. You can see the clips there from the vascular exploration and clipping. And uh, this is his result. And slowly you will see at six months that head of humerus come back again to the home position. It was a mighty relief to see that because that means that the deltoid has started firing and functioning. And uh, this was his uh, result. This was October 2017 still struggling, pain, the hair, shoulder looked hairy. And this is his September 2018, a year back. Again, his review is usually in September. Last year he came in November, he's done better than this. So he's got active, now he's 120, 120 and 40 degrees external rotation and continues to improve. My impression is they continue to improve for almost 18 months after the nerve surgery. But most importantly, his pain has gone. His proximal, uh, his distal migration has corrected. 
his wasting has reversed and his active movements are reasonably okay he is able to do his work we, you will achieve rotations after hemiarthroplasty provided the motor uh, nerve is working provided the greater tuberosity is integrated very well so look here you can see that all that wasting has recovered completely he has got a normal contour back so that was a big relief but these can be challenging cases which can go significantly pear shaped so his power has also come back thank you great thank you very much okay so that's great so i think uh, if there are no burning questions we should uh, sir yeah, one, uh, one last one last uh, one yeah. last question to dr ashish yeah. uh yeah dr arvin gupta has asked one question to ashish that how to restore the version in hemi shoulder and uh, is it vary from patient to patient and if yes then how to identify that right arvin there is a very long lengthy answer to that we will starve <laughs> the audience today but to cut the chase number one every one of us has a unique version in fact our left and right shoulders have different versions to each other that was based on a uh, paper we published in the journal of anatomy uh, you have to evaluate version intraoperatively you can evaluate it on ct scan pre operatively in somebody who is not fractured but that's besides the point so in intraoperatively you have jigs by the companies you can evaluate it we usually use the transepicondylar axis to confirm that so that requires a little bit of practice and understanding but we'll probably use that as a subject for next time but it's important to replicate the version so that the force tension and the length tension between the scapular humeral muscles is exactly as it was pre trauma then they will get back that full function can i just may, uh, yeah. say a few sure. one so the so the one thing uh, we do here in lester we have not buried all our hemi arthroplasty so we do still do some hemi arthroplasty and in certain places in india where you don't have anything else hemi arthroplasty may be the only option available so but there are two things we need to be very clear about the hemi arthroplasty as ashish has said depends on how the tuberosity is healed so the most important thing is if you have a good chunk of the greater tuberosity then a hemi arthroplasty well done hemi arthroplasty will work just make sure that tuberosity is not a mush or very comminuted or very small fragments that's one secondly as ashish says you need to use a fracture scan not only that you need to use what is called a platform system the platform system is a hemi arthroplasty which you can convert to a reverse shoulder without removing the stem and i think people sh should see if they can get hemi arthroplasty which has got a platform stem because it's not always possible to convert it but i have done it few times and it's always a great thing to uh, have it the third is axillary nerve if there is a partial axillary nerve most of the time it will recover it re just requires a big heart and a, a balls of steel as they say which most of the orthopedic surgeons have just have to hang in there monitor it very carefully with the uh, with the uh, emg it may take up to a year for it to recover yeah okay So uh, Rajiv, I think you. Uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, there is a case by Dr. Mahesh Shone. Shall I print case? Oh. Uh, yeah, one quickly, quickly, please, please to the to the all all the all the panelists. Just quickly, just uh, advise him. It's a fresh fall, forty-five year female. Uh, that opinion of the house, please. Do any have any other so other hmm. X-rays? Do we have so any single? single no, I have single. We need some more views there. Oh, just one X-ray. And uh, yes, sir. At forty-five, the upper end humerus mm -hmm. looks little odd. Did she have any other problem earlier? Yeah. No, sir. It's a fresh uh, today's oh. history. Uh, got this X-ray only. Uh huh. So. so yes, John. You go. I would say just looking at this, it would be one that would probably need fixation, but I would definitely get a lateral, and maybe even a CT because I think the tuberosity is off here. Correct. Before making a final decision, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with John. Just make sure there is no neurology there. Firstly, uh, this is not an adequate. I won't go do anything till I have more views and a CT scan. 
then you can, I think this is, even I would suggest we should try and fix this. <laughs> How you fix it depends on what you are good at. Yeah. I would have nailed it. Uh, I'm sure John would have, and Ashish would have plated it. But this <laughs> is not for replacement. But whatever fixation device you use, just make sure you are good at it. And if you're not very experienced with this kind of injuries, just send it to somebody who is. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, I would agree with yeah. that. Okay. So, yes, yeah. so thanks to all the faculty. And uh, I think Rajiv, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, or, uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, uh, uh, all the panelists and all the uh, presenters. I especially thank Dr. Vikas Agase and Dr. R.K. Pandey and Dr. Thira Thirachai. I think he had just left. He yeah. has asked that he is leaving. And uh, I especially thank Dr. Asis Babulkar from Pune. And of course, our mentor, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, who has conducted so nicely. And it's a matter of great pleasure that uh, 2,000 plus viewers were with us. And it was a wonderful show. And I thank my president, uh, BOA, Dr. Manoj Chaudhary. And thank you very much. And thank uh, Samshul, who have, you have conducted so nicely. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.